you are listening to the Necropolis Podcast, which is brought to you by Jason from Goatcraft and Shelly from HateMeditations.com and Metal Lesion Magazine. As promised, we are back with some experiments. Um, this is an iceberg today of the metal media. Uh, if you are listening on that Spotify, make sure to check out that Hate Meditations YouTube channel to see the the iceberg and we do have a PowerPoint presentation for you today as we go through each uh, layer of the iceberg. So I feel that it's really important to actually discuss the happenings of the metal media since they control the narrative and as you can see from what we have there there's some good aspects to the metal media but the vast majority of it is uh, quite lacking in many regards. Um, so uh, we do have Shelly co-host. Uh, Shelly is uh, driving today's episode. Thank you, Shelly. Hello. Howdy. <laughs> howdy. Howdy, howdy. And we do have uh, Tyler. Tyler is here. He's on time. And we are very, very appreciative that he is here with us today. Looking forward to his input on that metal media. Thanks for having me, guys. Happy to be back. Yeah, so how do you guys want to tackle this? So as you can see on your screen, we I put together an iceberg uh, with the contribution of everyone. We kind of decided like this is the the iceberg. It starts off the major publications, which is you know, for, essentially for the normies. Um, and then under that, you have the more alternative publications. And I label that as hipster um, because, yeah, it's hipster stuff. There's still some hipster DNA in the alternative metal media um and underneath that we have the the youtubers uh, youtube has you know exploded in popularity and there's so many different channels with a lot of different things happening and they're also contributing to the narrative and the the metal media um as well as social media uh we do have a couple of slides to present there and as we go through each layer we will be getting into the nitty-gritty of the aspects here as you can see um as you go further down the iceberg um, eventually you turn into an old man and ready for death. So, uh, that's at the bottom of the iceberg. You're, you're, you're just, you know, it's like you you're a true metal warrior and the current state of affairs have mortally wounded you. So, uh, let's go ahead and start with the, the major publications. Uh, so first up, we do have decibel magazine and I do have to say that I'm friends with some people over at decibel magazine, as you can see. Uh, they have written about me, and this is from an interview. There's my mug right there from one of their issues. I was in their magazine. That was before I actually started talking to them and all that. But um, So I do have some skin in the game, and I feel that instead of just a stranger criticizing uh, some of these publications, that it might have a little bit more weight, being that I've been in quite a few of these publications with my GoCraft project. Um, so with Decibel Magazine... I, I believe the print issues are kind of waning, and I know Dustbowl has been kind of uh, branching out. They have their flexi disc stuff. They have their uh, their festivals and beer and all that, and they're, they're doing alternative ways to uh, generate income. So uh, I, I definitely see the the printed magazine for all magazines in general uh, declining, and you know in the coming years. But uh, Decibel Magazine, uh, a lot of friends of mine um, here in Texas uh, refer to them as hipsters. I would just say they're hipsters. I, I would just say that they have more of like a, uh, I, like a Disney impression of extreme metal. Um, uh, uh, let, me, let me just, what do you think of Decibel Magazine, Shelly? I know you're, you're ready to unload on some of these publications. Uh. Well, I'll first say we don't have Decibel in the UK. Um, my interaction with it mostly comes through Decibel Books because they've released a few books that have been of interest over the years. Um, but I'll preface this, um, and especially the print media level, by just contextualizing the fact that the music press, as with most aspects of music at the moment, is in financial like dire straits. Um, at the time of recording, I don't know if you, the news really hit in america because i'm not sure if pitchfork has a big uh, us following but basically pitchfork is one of the larger kind of 
alternative um, online publications for music in general. It's not a metal, metal publication. It's more just alternative music in general. But that was bought out by a larger company and a lot of staff lost their jobs. And it's kind of sparked a conversation about what the future of the music press is again. Um, there was a real panic in the 2000s when like the blog sphere really took off and it undermined print media. Um, and magazines have had to do a lot of work to stay afloat. A lot of them haven't survived. Um, so you kind of have to take everything they do with a pinch of salt and just think they are very constricted in terms of how they make their money, what they have to cover to make their money, um, and how much freedom they have in that regard, you know, because they might be like uh, coerced into covering certain bands repeatedly because that's what sells copies. Um, and so you kind of have to caveat that a little bit um and it kind of makes sense because you know music as sort of a viable financial entity is kind of on the wane it's more of like part time hobby uh, for a lot of people now or a little thing that they do outside of the day job um it's very much become a grassroots like uh like artisanal like pastime rather than a huge industry um like the taylor swifts of the world are kind of anomalous now and it makes sense that music criticism as a as a kind of part of that ecosystem would suffer as far as decibel specifically is concerned i think you could do a lot worse for a magazine of that level um i don't look at them as hipster i think they still cover music that i would generally recognize as metal even though obviously looking at the bands that we have on this particular screen i don't like any of them um but they are you know in the general metal ecosystem so you can't really oh there's mayhem and possessed there and yeah they've got real metal bands on there so compared to some of these uh publications i think you could do a lot worse in decibel and every now and then you know it's the whole the stop clock gives the right time of day twice a day they will have a really interesting interview sometimes a really like the daniel lake book um that came out a few years ago on usbm was a fascinating read there was a lot of issues with it that people picked up on in terms of like the bands that he interviewed and the coverage but i think on the whole daniel did an excellent job of covering what is a really challenging subject and he did it under sort of you know the decibel um umbrella so yeah i don't i don't have too many mean things to say about about this publication and we don't have to go into major detail on every single thing we're going to look at here because otherwise we will be here all day so i'll, I'll hand to tyler at this point <laughs> Well, thanks, Shelley. Uh, yeah, you said just about anything I could possibly say about the state of the magazine in general. I will say that, um, like you, I'm more familiar with their books than I am with the actual magazine. Uh, they did pen uh, Albert, Albert Madrian, I think is how you say his name, pen that uh, Precious Metal uh, Decibel Presents 25 Extreme Metal Masterpieces. Uh, that was a really enjoyable book. Uh, Albert did a really good editing job of presenting a lot of diverse perspectives, but not ones that uh, kind of just were filler and weren't interesting to read. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, that work. Uh, however, upon reading some of the reviews at Decibel, uh, I don't think it's a publication that I would recommend to a discerning metalhead. Um, like Shelley noted, you're going to have a lot of coverage of acts that are, frankly, garbage just for the sake of uh, selling copies of the magazine. Uh, but on an even deeper level than that, a lot of the writing that you come across um, really does something that I find irritating in metal publications or in metal reviews, which is to uh, focus on either purely aesthetics uh, or perhaps even worse, focusing on interesting stories about the band or its members outside of the music itself. Uh, there was a review of theirs of a group uh, called Black Gath, I think, that was that committed this uh, kind of metal publication sin that really just was uh, almost entirely focused on the fact that these people are really into skateboarding. And their music is, of course, about skateboarding because they're really into skateboarding. That really doesn't help me to discern whether I want to listen to the music or not. It just gives me an idea of, I guess, what the hobbies and preferences of the band members are. Um, 
And it's something that I find really irritating in a lot of metal publications. It's really seemingly trying to commodify heavy metal and make it into a lifestyle choice where you like certain flavors of soda. Well, you should listen to these bands or you like to, I don't know, build model ships. You should listen to this band. Um, just like telling you what to spend your money on. Um, guess that it you know, makes sense for them as a business model. And they have apparently, as I noted, done things that were worthwhile reading. So maybe they just kind of have a bit of a torn identity between trying to make enough money to put food on the table and trying to respect the genre that they have some devotion to. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, um, well, it's almost like a more generic magazine, like Good Housekeeping or something, where it's like you get a lifestyle influencer on and they say, these products will help you present this particular thing or whatever. And it's kind of crossing over with some music journalism in that sense. Uh, one thing I didn't mention as well is their fucking hell, their top 40 albums of the year lists. I could almost write them in August before they publish anything, because I just know what's going to be on it. It's, it's almost, you know, if Enslave release an album in a year, it will be on their list. If to mold or blood incantation release an album that will be on their list or panopticon or whatever you just kind of know what's going to be on decibels top 40 list so yeah oh for sure yeah because napalm they're going death. to that too yeah 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 they're really in the napalm death over there um just i, I had a couple of things to just kind of chime in on uh yeah the daniel lake book daniel lake is a phenomenal fucking writer i've seen some of his other writings outside of uh the music uh journalism that he does and he's actually a fucking fantastic writer all around um a very very talented guy um but uh uh albert he got his uh uh teeth cut uh writing that choosing death book and i actually read that um when i was when it came out when it was still new and i was you know pretty young and i, I gleaned a lot of information from that um and it was a good little artifact back then and i guess that's what kind of projected you know his uh his course for doing a magazine and you also have to take in consideration that it's a magazine and that the style of writing like you said is it's going to be very surface level it's going to be about more of the the quirkiness of the individuals and the the writing itself is going to be fun and enjoyable uh and it's not going to be you know like a deep analysis of you know why this band succeeds or not it's going to be more of the the things that the average uh consumer uh perhaps would uh, like to know like skateboarding or i know they do like they give away game boys now or something like that and you know because there's the the big uh, retro gaming uh scene nowadays and i guess there's some overlap with metal uh, unfortunately and uh so they, they give away like some video game stuff here and there and they did some promotions and all that and uh i i don't agree with that person i think uh, video games should stay out of metal i uh, no real correlation there you know doom's a fucking great game but and there are some like metal aspects of the soundtrack on there but you shouldn't uh have that as a focal point for a metal publication and uh so uh as we progress through these, uh, there will be, you know, some publications that I have been in that they have reviewed my music uh, a lot of times very favorably. So uh, just to not say that I'm not here just to destroy these publications. We're just here to discuss the current state of the metal media uh, and uh, possible futures of, you know, what the, the scene uh, may be in the, you know, as time progresses and, you know, obviously the the printed publication of magazines will be going away eventually. And uh, another thing that I noticed is uh, Decibel is, has a huge uh, uh, online presence, and they've actually ran a, an ad for the specific podcast before. Um, so uh, not to throw too much shade at them, you know, I, I do appreciate when they do highlight some of the more underground good bands. Um, I do appreciate that, you know, reaching a lot more people. But uh, a lot of the, the online stuff seems to just be like, okay, they received a promo from this record label or whatnot and um, PR company, and then they're like obligated just to churn out a quick review or something like that. And it, it just seems like uh, it's not really... Uh, I know we'll get into it later when we talk about the smaller blogs that kind of just regurgitate promos. Decibel, they don't really regurgitate promos, but they still write about a lot of the same, you know, promo blitzes and all that. And there's a lot of like random uh, featured bands on their website that I, I just think it's just uh, 
filler content just to have something published, you know, every day. So uh, go ahead, Tyler. I'm sorry for stepping on you. Oh, you're good. I have said, I've said about all that I needed to say, other than that. Thanks for bringing up the Choosing Death book, because I always forget that Albert wrote that one as well, and I have read that one, and that was also a pretty phenomenal book. I've not read it, but it was hilarious when it came up on my Amazon recommendations. Amazon recommends Choosing Death. Thanks, Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, Should we move on, then? Yeah, yeah, let's move to the next publication. You spent too much time on Decibel. Well, we don't have to spend too much time here. Um, so, Krang is probably the biggest one uh, from the UK side, and it started back in 1980, I believe. It's like a way to cover when it's when the new wave of British heavy metal was getting really big. Um, it kind of rode off the back of that. So, it did have its roots in metal. And when I was growing up in the early 2000s, it was still, you know, it, it would cover a lot of generic rock, as you can see from the covers uh, here as well. A lot of it would be, yeah, pop punk, um, at the time, new metal, um, stuff like Red Hot Chili Peppers. But they would always have reviews of genuine metal albums. Um, and they'd have their sort of toe in that. And they were an incredibly big presence as far as, like, the rock zeitgeist, um, especially in the UK. And also a big part of that was Kerrang! TV. Um, in fact, one of the one of my gateways was a CD that came with a copy of Krang uh, that had happened to have an Arch Enemy track on it. And again, this is when I was very young, didn't know much, was still listening to fucking System of a Down and stuff. Um, but yeah, really dug the Arch Enemy album, and that kind of spiraled into you know discovering at the gates and then going down to Morbid Angel and Carcass and so on. And it was all downhill from there. So Krang do play a role in sort of my. Um, you know, the deep history of me getting into metal. But as you can see, obviously, everybody knows the middle cover, the infamous uh, black metal uh, cover story they did um, back in the day, which kind of exploded the Norwegian black circle and caused a great rift when um, they basically sensationalized the entire scene. And it's kind of the start of everything that guys like Fenriz and Varg despise about what black metal became. And because Kerrang! is kind of like the most generic mainstream of the rock magazines, they did not cover it with any sense of nuance or purpose or like uh, willingness to understand what black metal was. They just wanted to sensationalize it and make it this huge kind of psychodrama, which it did end up being. But yeah, uh, so that, that was just why I wanted to include them. I don't think there's any point in sort of unpacking the underlying thing because they're just like decibel but much much more superficial um as far as like their coverage goes yeah their historical importance i think is uh indisputable um but i went to go familiarize myself with their recent activity and i said to you before the podcast started shelly i pulled up their website and saw several stories covering alkaline trio and taking back sunday and i just thought no no (laughs) (laughs) well that's Uh, what i mean most of it will be that and then you have to go like if well back in the day when it's print magazine you'd go back to the back where all the reviews are and you'd find you know some random reviews of like a bigger death metal band you'd see like you know if for instance morbid angel had released a new album they'd cover that sort of thing but nothing more right was it Kerrang or maybe another publication like Metal Forces that was uh, famous or perhaps infamous for covering groups like uh, Hellhammer and Voivod and Bathory and absolutely roasting them in the reviews? Um, oh, it could have been. Like just despising their material and then years later, of course, being like, oh, they're legendary, they're classic, <laughs> you know? Um, after their importance was established, but when they first got, you know, arrived on the scene, they just absolutely trashed them. It could have been Kerrang. Now you mention it as well that the infamous black metal edition. It does. It did have a little bit at the end of the article where it was like, "Here's some non-Norwegian bands you should check out," and one of them was Havo Hedge and Behirit. And I was like, "That's quite cool that those bands landed up in Kerrang." Because I know everyone in like within black metal knows about them, but they're pretty obscure. It's kind of cool that you know, have a hedge, have a little footnote in the history of Kraken, given that they cover yeah, Green Day Believe and it or no. romance now. <laughs> right? Yeah, that is interesting, because uh, 
I would actually, believe it or not, expect a normie to perhaps have heard of even Burzum and Mayhem, just because of the psychodrama that you mentioned earlier. Uh, but Havohe and Beherit, I would be much less, uh, like, I, w- I would think it's much less likely that any kind of normal person would have ever heard those names before. Yeah. Um, so the fact that they were in Kerrang is, is pretty surprising. Pretty yeah, cool, absolutely. Like yeah. Uh, Jason, any thoughts on Kerrang? Uh, I just know about the, uh, the Burzum black metal issue, and I, I don't think uh, this magazine is in the U.S. When I was a kid, I primarily uh, read uh, Metal Maniacs. Um, that's where first time I discovered uh, Craig Zoller. Um, um, I remember seeing his name in there, um, but the director of Bone Tomahawk and all that. Phenomenal guy. Um, and I know with... Uh, Decibel, I know we already passed that slide. They, I, there's some overlap with the Metal Maniacs guys, but they all know each other. Um, but with Kerrang, I I don't know shit about Kerrang. I, I just pulled up some covers and put them into this presentation. And I'm like, yeah, it's like stupid My Chemical Romance, Green Day, and a whole bunch of pop music. So, uh, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that they, they wrote about black metal. But then again, it's like everyone wrote about black metal back then because of the murders, the the church burnings and all that. And it was a big story and it definitely sold a lot of issues for these publications. So I'm ready to move on to the next uh, publication if you want. Cool. Well, yeah, that issue was also referenced in the film, uh, Lords of Chaos as well. I don't think they specifically mentioned Krang, but it's clearly meant to be that in terms of like the, uh, the moment when it all got out of control for them. But yeah, anyway, we can move on. Um, Metal Hammer, again, I'm not, 100% sure if you have this in the US. I think it's a UK thing mostly, but um, this is like the biggest proper quote unquote metal publication that I'm aware of. Uh, we used to have Terrorizer, which was much more focused on things you would recognize as extreme metal more generally, but unfortunately that caved uh, quite a few years ago now. Metal Hammer is still crawling along, still has quite a lot of influence. Um, and again, as you can see from the cover, clearly they're not, you know, um, particular about the bands that they will cover. Um, they kind of have to do a similar dance to Decibel in terms of like making sure they're still selling. Um, they have also massively expanded their online presence. I think it's called like uh, Louder, their online um, version. And, you know, they've expanded it to be its own entity whereas you know a lot of magazines back in the day would just have a really really basic website that was just you know for the sake of having a website but now it's more of like an online magazine as well um but metal hammer were really kind of important for i guess what you'd call like teeny metalheads that are just starting to discover things like cradle of filth and arch enemy and timu borga um and in need of like a, just a little media outlet for that and Metal Hammer kind of really services that audi- that audience of like fans that definitely think they like metal, um, but you know have no clue about sort of underground metal and probably no interest in it. Um, but it's still definitely something you would recognise as metal, unlike Kerrang, which is much more just like generic uh, pop and rock stuff as well. So yeah, again, not too much to say about this. It's very superficial. It's very surface level. But expecting anything more intellectual from this is kind of a fool's errand in a lot of ways. I've read a lot of Metal Hammer when I was a teenager, I think. Um, It's hard to remember all the different publications I read back then. Terrorizer was definitely one of them. I really liked Terrorizer. And I think I read some Decibel, too. Um, But... um, even though I think that they're not like commonly available in the U.S., I somehow or another I was able to I was able to read Terrorizer because I remember that one in particular. Uh, yeah, Metal Hammer. I familiarized myself with them through their uh, website, which is called Louder Sound, and um, they were largely covering material that I didn't care for on a personal <laughs> level. I wonder how um, I'm going to put that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on, a, I guess, a more technical level, so to speak, um, they they were definitely not the worst of the example of this, but um, they definitely were another example, kind of like Decibel, um, that had um, 
a lot of focus on things like either aesthetics of the bands being discussed or aspects of their lives that were extra musical. You know, like the fact that this band was originally from Iran and fled Iran uh, for fear of censorship or even possible imprisonment. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one thing to mention that, not even just in passing, but, you know, as part of a discussion in a review about an album. But for the entire review to focus on that aspect, it starts to uh, seem almost like promotional material at that point. Um, you know, or the fact that uh, another band had um, a member, uh, the main songwriter, who was uh, diagnosed with acute myeloid, or however you say that, leukemia, and uh, that was a huge part of his writing process. And I'm sure it was, but I still have no idea what that album sounds like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was... Uh, I get that that's a format that's directed towards a certain audience, as Jason said. Um, you know, and obviously these publications are not intended for people like us. But people like us are the ones on this podcast talking about it. So there's my well, yes, perspective it, of Metal Hammer. <laughs> it's the human interest side of it, isn't it? I call it court gossip. But yeah, it's like there's nothing wrong with being interested in celebrity. Well, there is something wrong with being interested in celebrities lives, but it's clearly, it's a very pervasive thing. It's not unique to metal, uh, but it is a shame that it takes away from like the actual analysis of, of the music. Um, even if it's music that we don't think is particularly deep, it would be interesting to actually get a thought that focuses on that rather than uh, the wranglings of the lineup or the personal goings on of their lives or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, at least more so than some of the things we're getting ready to talk about with like some of the purely online publications. Their writers are somewhat good. Uh, there's some ones I, I'll keep. I'll keep it to my close to the chest for now. But there's some ones coming up where some real doozies with writing quality. But uh, I'll hand <laughs> it off to Jason. Yeah, I pretty much concur with you two. Um, while researching Metal Hammer, because I wasn't really familiar with this publication, um, I noticed that a lot of the content they they feature is very fecal. And when I looked at their website, too, you can tell uh, they're in dire straits when the whole fucking website's just fucking advertisements. And uh, I got so many ads for refrigerators at Best Buy um, looking at the, the Metal Hammer website, I'm like, I understand it's a, a business that they have and they're trying to bring in revenue, but it's just so fucking out there with the, the ads and all that. And I, I don't know why anyone ever would uh, read this publication. Um, so as you can see from the, the covers, this was like the first results when I talked to Metal Hammer magazine cover and you have like the the girly boxing lady you have the baby metal and you have fucking sleep token and the first article i saw on the web page was that uh the guy from tool pretending to be a baby in a crib so uh very very fecal content i i wish that this publication did not exist i would imagine they only do a disservice to metal um even though they're, they're claiming to be a metal hammer and all that they're more like a uh a, a, a flaccid penis um hammer so uh, there's that. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, Mr. Shelley. All right. So this, is, I think we're in sort of the territory of online stuff. Um, Metal Injection and Metal Sucks, I honestly, I can't tell them apart. Um, like I see, I'll see stories come up um, every now and then because obviously they, they cover any of the sort of major things going on in the metal world. Um, beyond that, like... They are kind of the online equivalent to the the print media in that they are, you know, they're struggling um, as far as like the finances are concerned, which kind of does uh, drive a lot of where their content goes. So it will be stuff that generates clicks. Um, and it's obviously not a novel thing to say, but it, you know, it's still true in that most of it is clickbait. Most of it is, as Jason's already alluded to on the Metal Hammer online side of it, it's stuff with adverts. Um, so you can't, most articles are probably less than 500 words and most of the space is taken up with pop-ups and flashing adverts and things like that. All of the headlines are stuff to get you to encourage to click on them, whether it's an artist that you are familiar with. I mean, you can see there, uh, Zach Wilde, ACDC, they're not really covering anything that would be particularly novel or there's this sensational story about the Elon Musk thing. 
And that's very, very typical of the kind of thing that I see on Metal Injection and probably the reason why I can't tell it apart from Metal Sucks. No, um, I can definitely so. tell it apart from Metal Sucks. Um, so Metal Injection, and granted, I've been in this one too. <laughs> They've written about <laughs> me a couple of times, I think. And uh, and uh, so Metal Injection, what I've noticed with them throughout the years is they don't have like a real political stance that they try to get through with their content. It's just content, content, content. Um, whereas the, the metal sucks, for instance, has a political agenda. Um, and it's more of like a gossip website. This is just like, you know, random news of happenings in metal, which I understand there's a, a desire for that. And, you know, for a lot of people to understand like, okay, this guy is, you know, he just had a heart attack or whatnot. And I like his music, but, um, but the like it, as you can see there's just a lot of random things like elon musk it's like elon musk is fucking retarded <laughs> it's like in a metal publication but uh oh sorry show i'm not supposed to say that word um it's fine it's I, descriptively I, accurate but it's not um not kosher as far as language goes but never mind jason but you're right in terms of like if you just want if a story has broken and you just want to find out what the basics are you do go to somewhere like metal injection but unfortunately there's just not that much breaking news in metal. So they kind of have to make stuff up or just, you know, regurgitate. So-and-so is booked on this festival. So-and-so is announcing a new single, new tour dates for this band. And yeah, obviously it's a resource for that and it, it has a clear purpose. But when there's nothing forthcoming, they just have to make stuff up or really sort of scrape the barrel in, in terms of like filling up the uh, column inches with, with gumph, basically. Yeah, they have a massive following, um, so they're definitely a bigger publication. So when they do feature bands that uh, are very underground, like myself, for instance, it, it just opens you know that music up to a way bigger audience. Uh, so I, I, I think when it comes to like how bad a publication is, I don't think Metal Injection is really that bad. They're more of like a just a tabloidish, you know, random metal happenings and all that, and. Uh, you know they do have reviews and uh you know that those reviews reach a lot of people so um tyler any thoughts on metal injection yeah so out of the online publications that i kind of gave a forewarning that some were real doozies this one was probably the least offensive um obviously if you're looking at the publication as a whole uh they have a lot of news content quote unquote uh shelly's pretty much already covered that but i did get into some of their reviews i read a recent review of theirs of uh an album lucifer five by a band called lucifer they're kind of one of those occult rock nostalgia driven bands and uh despite the fact that i don't like that band in particular or really that style as a whole at all it was somewhat well written uh Keep in mind, when I say somewhat well-written, that's in the context of how good is this compared to stuff that I think isn't that good? Uh, how, co how good of writing is this in the arena of not that good metal writing? And in that arena, it's somewhat okay. Uh, strong emphasis on the somewhat okay. So yeah, they you know props to them for that, for not being uh, absolute garbage. Uh, they actually could put some decent sentences together that communicate a point rather than just tossing a word salad of uh, adjectives at me. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, not entirely damning then. Uh, so moving on. Uh, oh, Christ. Uh, yeah, I have Hell not. Yes. <laughs> I've not spent much time on Blabbermouth. I probably come across it again when I'm Googling a particular story if i'm interested in it and it'll be one of the top hits um but in general it scrolling down the website today just briefly before this episode to remind myself was just a sea of very geriatric faces where it's just i mean we did an episode on legacy acts quite a while ago but it, it just felt like yeah this is for this is just filled with like faces from the past. There's no interest in sort of even covering newer content. It's very much just like we know the staples of the bands that we need to cover, and this is what we're going to just regurgitate. And it's very sort of banal. Uh, but again, probably not too much point me spending too long on this because if you go to Blabbermouth expecting 
anything more than uh, you're wasting your time. I know for a fact a lot of musicians read Blabbermouth just for like the metal news. <laughs> and uh, so I, you may talk about like the sea of geriatrics and the, you know, the sea of gray hair on there. Um, but uh, a lot of the, the death metal musicians that we, we know um, and love quite a bit, um, they, they do read the Blabbermouth. And it's a, it's a hell of a popular publication, um, even though it just kind of has the modus operandi of just churning out random news about random people in a, a metal that, you know, past their prime and all that. So um, how it's still very popular, I have no idea. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of uh, uh, musicians in the metal scene that read blabbermouth.net and that's how they get their news about, I guess, you know, people that they toured with or listened to, um, as their kids and you know got influenced to create metal so i i think the uh, the blabbermouth.net is on its way out um i know back in like 15 years ago 20 years ago it was the place to go for metal news um and i think it just sticks around for that reputation and of course you know the the content that they have is just caters to uh the older metal demographic um yeah there's not really much to say it's just old people news in the metal scene uh and you know sometimes they they do have like a review here or there and uh things of that nature but va the vast majority of the content on blabbermouth.net is in the name of the the fucking publication it's just a blabbermouth of random news articles about geriatrics go ahead tyler yeah jason that was what really shocked me the most was seeing how low i suppose you could say the website has come i remember at one point any kind of major happening in the metal scene was largely being covered by and sometimes even being debated by the involved parties on blabbermouth and now i go there and it seems like i don't know they clearly are still posting articles but the the quality of the articles and what the, co the what they're covering makes it seem like the place is dead that it's just uh, sort of spurting out information a stream of information that not that probably not too many people care about um just because that's what the website does and um you know it, if you look at the its new stream compared to um metal and in, metal injection uh it not only does it look incredibly similar, they're covering a lot of the exact same stories, like rockers paying tribute to MC5's Wayne Kramer following his death, um, and several others. Well, yeah, like I said, there's only so many things that happen in, me happen in metal, like week on week. So if you have several websites that are pretty much dedicated to just covering the major stories, they're all going to be covering the exact same thing. And unless they're going to be writing like context or analysis of it in any kind of deep or meaningful way, then yeah, it will just be, you know, people will have their preferred source and they'll just go to that. There's no point looking at the same story on blood and mouth and then going to metal injection or whatever. I have a funny story about blabber mouth. Um, back in the day, uh, you know, the band brutality, they, they, they had a guitarist that, uh, you know, there's a trans, and when they went through the operation and left the band, the, the band put out that the the guitarist had tr transitioned. And Blabbermouth took that as the guitarist dying, <laughs> the way it was phrased. And they wrote like the RIP to the guitarist that was trans. So obviously they, they lack uh, the quality control and, you know, getting the facts straight. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just a funny little anecdote there because uh, the guitarist became trans and left the band. And the, the band put out a notice like, hey, this person has transitioned. And <laughs> the black mouth <laughs> took it as the person dying. So, um, yeah, good times, good times. So uh, let's move on to the next publication. Oh, well, we've got uh, Metal Sucks. Um, I guess this was you trying to demonstrate what you were talking about just now, Jason, in terms of Metal Sucks having a like political agenda on the side of it. I guess I don't even... Uh, uh, Lock that with the, the my interaction with Metal Sucks. Again, like I said earlier on, it's just 
I don't check these websites uh, out of habit. It's just when there is a big story um, that I'm Googling that, you know, there'll be two of the, the top hits or whatever. Um, so what have we got here? Editorial, of course, black metal is racist. It's evil. A Metal Sucks article. The Nazis were evil. There's nothing to get there. That's why the early founders of black metal were drawn to the Nazis. Those dudes didn't consider evil a church-sponsored word for organic or sexually open. They subscribe to the Christian definition of evil. Murder, horror, cruelty, coldness of heart, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, Varg, Varg would take take issue with that characterization um, as far as like the, the Christianization of... Uh, the evil definition there i mean there was a lot of rhetoric thrown around um and obviously they were they were kids kind of deliberately trying to be provocative and i think the thing that gets missed in a lot of this discourse is that social media didn't exist back then and the online media didn't exist um so you didn't get this kind of overheated like constant 24 7 barrage of like hot takes uh coverage and just this constant visibility so you could kind of do the ridiculous things that the black metal scene did and not quite fear the consequences so much. And I think that's one of the reasons why that Kerrang story was such a big deal, because it was the first time that a light had been shone on just exactly what these people were like and what was going on. And the metal scene at large kind of woke up to just how extreme one kind of corner had taken it. That that couldn't happen now because it would be all on social media within 24 hours and everyone would be racing to cancel it. And it is quite amusing to see as I'm getting older, seeing new generations grow up and discover black metal and trying to re-cancel it, um, even though it wasn't really formally cancelled because it was before that kind of word became a thing. So it is amusing to see Metal Sucks try and kind of get in with that zeitgeist a little bit and try and sort of align themselves with quote-unquote cancelling black metal or whatever by writing this very, very very surface level analysis of what exactly the politics were of black metal at the time if anything i mean they were largely incoherent so it's kind of redundant doing this but it's not really being covered in the most subtle way here yeah so metal sucks uh, is a uh, gossip website <laughs> go ahead yeah. tyler oh no i was just gonna mentioned that the world is a lot more boring of a place for all of the uh, effective censorship that happens with the social media phenomenon that Shelley was talking about. So the world's a lot more boring for that, for the fact that you can't get away with doing weird and crazy stuff. Uh, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd say there is something in that because it, it does mean that people are always second guessing what they're doing because they know that they will be scrutinized or they can't resist sharing every every aspect of like what they're doing as an artist on social media and they're kind of you know kind of encouraged to by you know the algorithm if you don't produce content all the time you don't uh, generate a following um and that's not to say you need to do like ridiculously politically extreme stuff you know to get attention but also the f black metal was not compelling because it dabbled in far-right ideology it was compelling because it did not give a shit and it really did make a point of pushing the boundaries of every social grace not just political but you know in terms of its exploration of just vulgarity and horror and monstrosity um and you kind of you need a bit of freedom and creative space to really explore that and yeah the oppressive light of constant visibility just doesn't really allow for that anymore Uh, so yeah, uh, anything else to add to Metal Sucks before we move on? Uh, Metal Sucks is fecal. I hope they, uh, they their business gets run into the ground for all the gossip and you know trying to just generate controversy themselves by trying to cancel various people. Um, and uh, I, I, I think the I, I've heard from a lot of my friends too is the. The, the metal sucks. Um, it's right there in the, the title of the publication of it, not holding metal in a respective place, like respectable place where, you know, you want to revere the good aspects of metal. And it's like right there in the title is metal sucks. Ha ha. Look how ironic we are. Um, I didn't put them in the hipster tier because I don't think they're 100% hipster, but there is a spinoff that we'll get to later. Um, but that's my uh, two cents on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we... Sorry, Tyler, go on. 
Oh no, you're all right, man. I'm a, I apologize. Um, it may make you feel happy to know, Jason, that they have a lot less gossip stories on their website now. And I think that's not because they've decided to turn against that trend or whatever. I think it's just because they're not doing as well. They don't have as much material to write about. That stuff was all the rage. It had its 15 minutes of fame and now people don't care. So, um, now they've kind of, it seems like from looking at their website now, they've shifted more in the direction of being yet another boring, uh, metal news stream. Yeah, you can only get so much mileage out of just being provocative for the sake of it. Like, no matter where you sit on, like, the political spectrum or whatever, if you're just writing stuff to piss a certain crowd off, then that, that has a shelf life as far as, like, generating a following goes. But... Yeah, I'm so burnt out of all these publications having their specific political stance. And it's like, I'm not even brave enough for politics anymore. It's like, just leave, leave the politics out. Let's just get to the meat and potatoes of the, the, the music. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, well, I'll... um, uh, Yeah, so I'll, I'll just carry on here. So, yeah, we're moving down to uh, hipster publications now. Um, so, okay, you've used the word hipster, and I know exactly what you mean, um, but I guess even the word is a little bit loaded. But basically, this means stuff that is lower down in terms of having a following as the mainstream publications. Um, so it's more like music-focused, does make more of a show of actually focusing on the substance of uh, releases and writing about the culture. Um but not all of these websites are necessarily dedicated to metal, but they do um, at least cover metal in large part. Uh, but I guess we call them hipster because they are also, they're into the aesthetic of metal over the substance. I think that's the the most non-controversial definition I can give of hipster, given the word has kind of lost meaning at this point. But yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't have much to say about these guys. I mean, in a lot of ways, following them on social media is very similar to the websites we've already discussed in that they will just regurgitate court gossip promos. Like I saw, I was scrolling down their Twitter feed the other week and I just, it was, again, Ozzy Osbourne has announced uh, XYZ. Kiss are doing this. Uh, there's an action figure of Cliff Burton being released. And it was just, is this, is this what the heady, like publication does is this what they think like heady coverage of metal is and i know that's just the twitter feed or whatever and there's more substantive reviews behind it um but it it <clears throat> there's just a certain hubris about the way they cover music um where they make a show of being the intellectual heady version but when it comes down to it they have absolutely nothing of substance to say and i i really Orange, uh, Invisible Oranges gets gets my back up far more than any of the Kerrangs or the Metal Hammers are concerned because at least I know where I stand with them. They're, they're transparent with what they do and they're honest about it. They're just generic rock slash metal, like large publications, and they will have a massive commercial aspect to it because that's who they are and they're very transparent about it. Whereas Invisible Oranges is still trying to play the game of being a little bit underground and a little bit of the, uh, you know, the upstart thing but in reality they've got too big for their own good now and they are just another metal sucks or whatever as far as like the quality of their content goes any kind of any agenda or thing they had to say has sort of been jettisoned at this point uh so yeah i, c I can't really string a coherent sentence together about them at this point so i'll hand I hand, hand this one off yeah i read their deep dive into uh, note to self stop starting sentences with yeah anyway i uh, read their deep dive into black metal in um shelly what's the city's how do you say the city in the netherlands is it utrecht um God. Uh, oh you're <laughs> pronunciation not my strong suit oh okay well it's not just a dumb american thing then no All it's right. not anyway. it's a city in the netherlands and uh, i was very disappointed to see that they didn't man mention uh samoth a single time while i know that john from samoth is technically from germany there's other people in the band who are from the netherlands and i think that they're officially billed as a dutch uh black metal band um 
But yeah, not a single time. Just bands I had no idea about. And then I read a little deeper into what these bands were. And one of the bands was bragging about how people from their area in the metal scene aren't interested in the occult or fantasy aspects of metal music, but what makes the music more real for them. And that this band in particular started as a grindcore band that then incorporated elements of screamo into its sound before discovering black metal. And I was like, ah, it's one of those kind of things. A guy from the punk scene who couldn't cut it in the punk scene and so decided to try to cut it in the metal scene and now thinks that they have the authority, despite being an outsider, to pass judgment on the metal scene uh, for what they find to be its shortcomings, which is mostly that it's not punk music. It doesn't cover real topics like politics and social issues it covers silly not things that you shouldn't take seriously like demons and dragons and stuff i don't really care what those kind of people have to say and the fact that this publication does uh kind of tells me a lot about it in my opinion yeah there's that one foot in one foot out uh attitude towards metal where it's like and i think that's a big part of what we would broadly call the hipster approach in that they lift elements that they like from different forms of music um which there's nothing wrong with doing that in and of itself but it becomes a way for them to pass judgment on the limitations of those forms of music when actually they haven't really engaged with the substance and the essence in any any way and what they're actually doing is just trying to express their own uh individualized either self-help or their identity or what they want their identity to be they're kind of using it as a little toy box um, and then they think they get to cast judgment on, oh, well, you know, singing about Satan is silly or whatever. It's like, well, you haven't really engaged with the topic. You've just lifted elements that you like and applied them to something completely different. And I think that's why black metal, more than any other metal subgenre, is susceptible to that, because it has such a strong aesthetic uh, element to it as far as like the guitar tone, uh, the the atmospheric qualities to it as well, which is kind of why until blood incantation form death metal was largely unaffected by that because it is much more of a um like ontological form of music in that yeah it's, it's all about the riffs and their construction and how the riffs compile uh, com- comprise a narrative and so on which the hipster is much less interested in because that requires a lot more thought and engagement with the uh, subject matter and invisible oranges are basically i sort of see them as the um yeah the mouthpiece for that uh, mindset within the metal community which i think is why i do hold them in such low regard anyway uh jason uh i know that you want to chime in on these guys oh yeah oh yes you guys hear me okay i, I did have to swap a device here but when it comes to this invisible oranges publication uh my my exposure with them was early on and they made a lot of waves because they were the quote-unquote intelligent um publication they would write articles and reference philosophers such as nietzsche um but it was all done and more of like this surface level uh type of way where um you don't really glean much substance of the actual music itself from the early articles but that's what really propelled them because they were the quote-unquote intellectual alternative to your blabbermouths and all that but the uh, the guy um that started that uh i sold it to brooklyn vegan and now john rosenthal runs it and it's turned into this ad fest so we're talking about you know a publication is dead when there's fucking thousand ads on a, a metal review and also when they get to it's like oh this week in metal or this month in metal these albums come out and they have like their their monthly or you know annual or whatever um albums that are coming out uh in the future that we should check out you know just compiling that information just to generate clicks you know it's on its way out and i definitely see that with the the leadership that they're under now 
the website has substantially waned in quality. There's a lot of fucking bullshit on there, bullshit articles like, you know, the, the promo blitzes that we talked about earlier with the, the decibel, you know, how they'll feature, you know, random bands on, you know, their spotlight on the, the webpage. That's pretty much fucking Invisible Oranges nowadays. I know uh, our, our uh, friend Joseph April, he used to be a, a writer for Invisible Oranges, and they did, I guess, have some financial... Um, income enough to help you know finance sending the writers out to go interview people and all that but i think that era is gone for this website this website is pure fucking trash it is dead and you know you go there you might fucking get malware from all the fucking ads so that's my two cents on the invisible oranges all right uh moving on so uh i included the quietus they're not a metal metal publication but they do have a regular feature uh where they round up recent releases that they want to cover um and they do occasionally write um actually quite interesting articles i read one which was like the history of keyboards within extreme metal and they covered stuff like nocturnus and emperor um and they kind of referenced it back to history and prog rock uh there was another one on uh, uk black metal i don't know if they ripped me off because i wrote an article on that uh, not too long ago um but um, so yeah, I don't want to, they they come from a very similar place to Invisible Oranges, although much less cynical. It is still a genuine, uh, like site where you'll see real music journalism and you will see real writing on, uh, music. Um, but the downfall is again, they come from the outsider perspective towards metal. Uh, they do have the benefit of like access, uh, quote unquote, in that they will have real journalists that, uh, you know, have time and resources to go and interview relevant people that they might be covering. Um, but the the whole orientation of it is again is is I think Tyler alluded to it earlier. Is they start from the premise that metal needs to be fixed. We need to be marking metal's homework and saying, right, let's lift the bits that we like and dispense with the rest and try and improve metal rather than meeting metal on its own terms um, and trying to understand where it's coming from. Um, so there is that conceit that, but far less cynical than Invisible Oranges. And I think there is like, it's still coming from a, a genuine place, uh, but it's not a place that I I sort of gen generally agree with. Um, but I will still visit them now and then just out of curiosity to see what they're covering. The metal albums they cover are sort of invariably dire kind of, you know, what we call hipster black metal or just the god awful dissonant death metal that just won't go away or you know the latest two mold album and they'll invariably just give it a give it the wave um so they're not particularly interesting if you're a metalhead and you want to go for them for recommendations but every now and then you'll see an interesting article where even if the writing is not particularly interesting to you the topic will at least be something a little bit more niche um which i think makes it that little bit more interesting um as far as like something a little bit different a slightly different approach to music coverage goes i don't know if you guys have ever come across this before again it might be a uk thing no um the first time i ever heard of them was when we put this iceberg together um i took one look at their uh, website and it looked like trash and that's my only thought <laughs> on that so um even the format is like not user friendly just you know it's not nice on the eyes and uh yeah so that's, I don't really have an opinion on the the quietest. I'll take your word as a hipster publication. They well, yeah. I'll, before I hand off to Tyler, I will caveat this by saying they make no secret of the fact that they are also in financial dire straits. Um, it's again they come under scrutiny with the collapse of Pitchfork, but you know they're very transparent about the fact that you know music journalism is struggling, and they're no exception. So they do have to change their format now and then. But you know, and respect to them for that. Uh, but yeah, that might impact the kind of the way the website is laid out at times because again, they're not immune to the fact that you have to generate clicks and views and traffic and so on. I was wondering why this was included, and now that you mentioned that they've written articles about the history of uh, keyboards and heavy metal and things like that, I wish I had been made aware of that because I was scrolling through this website wondering why we were going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've not had time recently to prepare for this. I should have chucked a few links in the chat. but Yeah, looking through the albums that they were reviewing and reading the reviews, I thought, are any of these even pretending to be a metal album? Um, 
and uh, didn't really find one. I found an Ala review they had written of uh, an Iron Maiden live album back in 2008, the year I graduated high school. <laughs> um, and uh, that was... No, they, uh, they reviewed, like, the new Crucio Mentum album. They reviewed, like... If, like, for instance, if God's uh, Flash or Death Spell Amiga release an album, they'll review it. Um, they have a journalist that is dedicated to metal, I believe, um, who, to be fair to them, does know their stuff, but they, as I mentioned, they come from, like, the Invisible Oranges mindset of thinking that older metal is dumb and newer metal is, like, where it's at in terms of maturity. That makes sense. Yeah, I either ju- just missed it or, you know, at some point... Like I just started skipping around on the review pages and just clicking on random pages, trying to find like a review of a metal album or something that could serve as an anchor for me. Um, reading what little I did read, I thought, okay, you know, it's okay quality writing. It's qu- clearly, cons- I could tell that it was a hipster, so to speak, publication right away, just because they were clearly have that sort of hipster collector mindset where they're very concerned about aesthetic and so there's going to be a wide variety of music that they cover because they're um, looking at everything for its aesthetic value almost solely Um, but yeah it was uh, wasn't like offensive in the way some of the worst of material from uh, Blabbermouth uh, or um, uh, especially Metal Sucks was, I was just a little confused is all. Yeah, no, uh, that's that's my fault. I dropped the ball in terms of like getting ready, but I'll I'll send you the link to that that article um, afterwards. It was a few years ago that I read it, but it, it I remember it being quite interesting, if nothing else, from like a factual kind of uh, perspective. But anyway, yeah, let's move on. So Toilet of Hell, I've only really come across these guys through their podcast, um, where. I don't know. I don't have anything terrible to say about them, but they do have quite a cutesy approach where everything again, I can see why they're on the hipster tier here in that everything seems to be irony driven in a lot of ways and that they will cover serious metal, but um, everything has to be done with two steps removed from the content that they're covering. Uh, But yeah, I don't know if, if you guys have something more substantive to say about them. Yes, I do. Um, so, Toilet of Hell, this is an offshoot of Metal Sucks. And this is, these are the intellectuals, quote-unquote, that were fed up with all the, the bullshit articles from Metal Sucks, and they decided to go their own way. There are commenters there on the, the, the articles on Metal Sucks, and they decided, well, we can do a better job. You know, we're, we're smarter and, you know, and blah, blah, blah than Metal Sucks. So they started Toilet of Hell, and uh, I came into contact with them because they had reviewed the Goatcraft, uh, one of the the toilet bowl things where they do their roundup and reveal a lot of different things, kind of like what you're doing nowadays when you review like you know eight bands at a time, and uh, and so that was my initial exposure. I also know that they've had spats with other people in the middle scene. They were trying to cancel Gary Holt for a while, and they you know a, a lot of character assassination articles that they have published on there about Gary Holt because uh, Gary Holt is obviously a, a red-blooded American and uh, and they, they didn't take too kindly to that and uh, so they, they tried to do a character assassination on him and as I looked at the website uh, you know before this podcast and it, it seems like they've kind of just backed away from that nowadays but um, at one point in time they were kind of going the the middle sucks approach by trying to do uh, cancel culture and all that so uh, that's my two cents on uh, toilet of hell um, I'm sure if you've encountered them Tyler uh, a little bit I wasn't aware of their connection of sorts to um, metal sucks but I have heard the name before but never really read them because it just came across to me just looking at the logo, which you know, probably is a superficial judgment on my part, that it was going to be just another generic metal online publication. Um, reading the review, I don't feel like that assessment was necessarily uh, off the mark. Um, but uh, not saying that they were bad in any way, like there was anything about it that irritated me or felt like it was 
factually incorrect, um, you know, or spreading misinformation or anything like that. Like, I guess their somewhat parent site is known for. Um, but, you know, it was just, and I get why they do this or, you know, even maybe they just have different tastes. It was just reviews of metal just because they like metal and not really particularly having a, a filter for quality there. Um, the review was okay. Probably one of the lower end ones out of the ones we read. You know, they had uh, sentences like, Versus an oath instead dabbles more in dark, dank dungeons underneath mighty castles. What the hell does that mean? Um, but um, but yeah, that's about my assessment of Toilet of Hell. Alrighty, I'm gonna stop. They are they they are a smaller publication. They're not on par with the Invisible Oranges and all that. It's just it's an offshoot of Metal Sucks. It's the more brainy side of that, which is why it's in the hipster tier. Yeah, that probably explains why I get the cutesy vibe from them as well. Um, so, yeah, moving on. We are now on YouTubers. Um, so, I guess we're including this because um, YouTube reviewers are becoming, or, well, 10 years ago they were becoming, but they are now a massive part of, like, metal coverage and a lot of people that don't necessarily want to, you know, prefer to get their music recommendations from a audio-visual source rather than reading. Um it has a huge kind of uh, part in the ecosystem now. Um, so we should probably discuss it. Um, and I'm aware that we're, you're probably listening to this on YouTube as well. So um, I think that's called lampshading when we kind of reference what we're actually doing. So these are like the, oh God, yeah, these are the reaction videos. So this isn't really journalism. This is, I guess this is the very essence of what you'd call content in that you get people that... Um, just react to a famous song um and it creates clicks because basically people want to relive the experience of listening to something for the first time because you're never going to recapture that magic but maybe watching someone else react to it um is kind of going to create simulation of that it's you know it's like saying to your mate check out this song i've heard and then watching their reaction to see if you kind of gauge them like absorbing it for the first time um but there are different levels to the reaction video in that some of them are like you see there the the vocal coach uh there's a lot of ones around drummers as well where it's like jazz drummer will react to the guy from Meshuggah or whatever um and i could see the appeal of that because you think well it's going to be an expert opinion they'll be talking about technique they'll be talking about their expert opinion on you know the uh techniques that they're using um how difficult that is uh what the crossover is with other other genres or whatever so there is like a place for that that's the surface level reading the underlying reason is people just want validation that their taste is on you know is professionally certified people want to know well of course my sugar are good because this highly qualified jazz drummer said the drummer's really good or of course like james hetfield is a a talented singer or that dude from disturbed is a talented singer because the vocal coach said so um and as far as the content creator is concerned it, the, the content generates itself just pick the most popular songs or infamous performances from some really popular metal bands play it react to it with your like knowledge and you do a little bit of acting there as well kind of feigning the emotional kind of response to it um and then yeah watch the watch the views come in um it's very very low hanging fruit as far as like analysis goes um and it's kind of the um the what's the word it's like a feedback loop of nostalgia for me in a lot of ways in that um we've had real nostalgia as far as like retro genres are concerned but now we're trying to recreate the feeling of discovering this music for the first time by living through these people's reactions and there's actually videos that will coach someone that wants to start a reaction channel um they will say like you need to present this sort of personality remember facial expressions are important and um remember to pause it every now and then to you know keep keep pausing it to discuss your like feelings and so on and blah blah blah. and it is literally like that is from the very worst nightmare of like the well of like this content nightmare that we live in in terms of like the fact that people are being coached to create this stuff and then we watch it as if it's like a genuine reaction to uh to a slayer song or a metallica song or whatever uh so yeah very very cynical kind of level of of youtubing but it has an absolutely massive 
ecosystem as far as views i mean you can see there 6.5 billion views 1.6 billion views this is big stuff as far as like the ecosystem of youtube metal is concerned it sucks and it's formulaic if any of you people who make these videos are watching this stop doing it you are heat death you are entropy give it up all right jason you can have the floor so yeah i think the the curiosity that has stemmed from these videos is from the sheer fact of uh, the fish out of you know the water out of your element being exposed to things that you wouldn't otherwise expose and i think that's a great part of why uh like the the opera coach or whatever um talking about you know death metal um could be interesting for some people um out there it's just an element that you know is complete inverse of what they they typically do as a vocal coach and and like tyler said it's too much of a formula they all have the same formal format and uh yeah it's, it's, it's just shitty fucking content that is just there to uh cause brain death um let's move on to the next slide because i think we have uh some other uh some other uh how was the slaughter yeah uh th sorry i know you want to move on the last thing i will say is it also has a very short shelf life as far as like diminishing returns go because if you're a jazz drummer reacting to i don't know the 10th tech deaf drummer that you've been recommended there's only so many times you could feign surprise before it's like well you've been doing this channel for two years now you must have heard most of the big names in that genre so it's hardly going to be a surprise to you anymore so you can't do the reacting to a genre for the first time uh, ad infinitum because it's yeah it's just gonna have a shelf life so yeah moving on uh <laughs> yeah we're really getting into the meat of the um this like i should say this is like the independent level so these these are not these people that are not like their job isn't to be a music journalist and so on they're not in the print media these these are much lower down as far as like their their pull is concerned uh so these are independent creators but they're also sort of engaging in the worst aspects of consumerism within metal in that um, they seem to be genuine people. Like they love metal from a very like pure place and it's either naivety or they're just incredibly good actors that makes them play into the commodification of metal. And the metalhead box is like, there's nothing different between the metalhead box and just 30, 40 years ago, buying merch, buying records, buying patches or whatever it's the same thing but it's like the distillation of that in that you're not going to a gig enjoying the music and buying a t-shirt afterwards to you know support the band or as a souvenir or whatever you're literally getting a subscription stuff through your door each month and you don't know necessarily what's going to be in there but you'll probably like some of it because you generally like all aspects of a certain kind of black metal or a certain kind of death metal and it really is just the merchandising of metal made at its most naked and raw state and i just hate the cynicism of it but i hate the fact that these people are kind of almost prostituting themselves to get a youtube channel going by doing these stupid unboxing videos and i don't know if they're aware of the cynicism that they're engaging in and recreating or not um but again as tyler said about the reaction videos just stop it it's content for its own sake and the people that watching it i don't know what you're getting out of it as far as like actual content goes it is just marketing plain and simple and there is nothing else to it yeah stop it too this is awful and you know you would think that content being made by individuals that there would be a potential for it to be cool you would get opinions from people who can't give opinions on major media outlets because the major media outlets don't think those would be profitable opinions to share not just for controversy reasons but because oh that's not something that everybody wants to hear that's not something that everybody would be interested in and won't get us the wide widest number of viewership but you get this instead i don't know what it is a well, I shouldn't say I don't know what it is about it. I mean, democratizing it, everybody's going to try to get their 15 minutes of fame. You're going to get the medium be oversaturated. Um, as, a, as a quick aside, I did like Samoth's parody of this format where they uh, were going to do an unboxing of the Greba Berg album 
And uh, John ripped open the box with his Bowie knife, and they all reached inside, and then they pulled out beers and said, uh, F you, and started laughing. (laughs) 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 That was pretty funny. Anyway, Jason, how do you feel about unboxing videos? I don't give a shit about your fucking buttons and stickers. That's it. Next slide. (laughs) Yeah, it's the equivalent to watching a kid open their Christmas presents. Like, But these are adults. These are real people. Apparently. Anyway. Uh, right, so bang a no. TV. <laughs> so the infamous Sam Dunn, uh, who made his name on the Metal Headbangers Journey uh documentary, but then he did a series on like the ages of metal and then he's done well, he's done a whole bunch of stuff now, but he's also heavily involved in Banger TV, which is kind of like I guess the closest thing YouTube has to like a metal kids TV channel. Um I wrote an article kind of lashing out at a lot of online metal content not too long ago, and, and someone commented rather astutely that the, the hosts of Banger TV kind of feel like hosts of a kid's TV show, and that really does sum up the kind of demeanor that you get on here. It's, again, taken on its own terms. It's completely harmless. They review albums, they look at old albums, they just discuss the music, but if you really dig down, there is absolutely nothing going on behind what they're saying they're not adding anything to the discourse they're not analyzing these albums in any meaningful way they're not really giving you any new knowledge that you couldn't find from a quick google or a few even like you know their wikipedia articles with charisma some of the stuff they do on like historic metal scenes or whatever um so it it really is just bunging up the uh the online space with drivel as far as like for everything they bring us you know in terms of like original like thoughts or analysis or anything about the music that they cover it's just um it is just again content pure and simple uh less uh like grating and cynical than the unboxing or reaction videos because they are at least saying new things about an album but um definitely very it's sort of like very very surface level very very um again a little bit cutesy at times as well so yeah, not not too much to sort of dig beneath on on this. That guy it, it, with the trucker hat is my worst enemy. Please go on, Jason. No, it really seems like a like a video game TV show where it's all surface level, and it's like, oh, good graphics. It's like, oh yeah, good riffs, and you know, shit like that. Where it's like, okay, uh, uh, you're not really saying anything about the the album other than some general descriptions. Um, and they also kind of go for uh, what we talked about in some of the, the major publications where they kind of focus on like the personalities, you know, behind the music uh, here and there. And, and I, I, yeah, it, it, everything they do kind of irks me the wrong way. It's, it's, it feels very inauthentic. Um, I know the guy in the trucker hat is welcoming us to doom metal from that image. And, uh, I, I don't want to learn about Doom from that guy. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, you know what really sucks about Banger TV is that Sam Dunn is the least annoying personality on the entire YouTube <laughs> and he's channel. He's annoying as fuck as well. <laughs> exactly. He he's his metal ahead Banger's journey was the most superficial overview on heavy metal that you could possibly get. It was a boring documentary, and he to have him be your best presenter on that channel is really an insult to the channel. Um, That guy in the trucker hat, back when the old school death metal trend was running strong, what was that, about two, two to, within the past two to four years? I mean, I know it's still kind of going, but it's not at its height anymore. Um, He was covering just about every awful album of that trend that was coming out. And I would peruse YouTube a lot to listen to these albums to try to find material to write reviews on, and I would always see him and listen to him give the most awful opinions ever about these albums, thinking that they're all good. And I would think to myself almost every time, do you remember this album like a month from now at all? You've covered probably hundreds. I doubt that you're listening to all of these regularly, and yet you seem to think that they're all the greatest thing that was ever released. Um, And yeah, I developed a real distaste for him. But overall, just a very superficial take on metal. Probably one of the ones that bothers me the most out of all of the ones we've covered so far. 
um, you know, metal sucks. Yeah, they have the whole gossip aspect as well as like the kind of toxic political uh, perspective. Um, but this, these guys in particular, you know, when people, friends of mine, try to talk about metal being infiltrated by politics and that ruining metal, I always remind them that's a more recent thing. Metal really died, if you want to put it that way, a long time ago because of this kind of view of metal that really normalized it, commercialized it, and made it very superficial, a very f- superficial look at aesthetics. Yeah, it's it's the false, it's the fake positivity to it as well. Every album has to be awesome because we're all a happy community that love each other. And it's like, yeah, fine. I'm not saying be mean for the sake of it. Don't, yeah, obviously not that. But if you think an album is shit, say it and say why and give some analysis on it. Not every single old school death metal album released in the month of January 2018 or whatever can be the best, dirtiest, most rottenest, slimiest thing you've heard. No one is that brain dead. Like, for God's sake, have an opinion of your own. And I think this kind of does just perpetuate the idea that it's all just one big happy community of churning stuff that we all love. And like that that review in the bottom left, the Sam Dunn uh, review of the Morbid Visions uh, re-recordings, um, uh, uh, to your point earlier, Tyler, in terms of the fact that they never really get to the substance, the review is only 10 minutes long. I had to click five minutes in for him to actually start talking about the the music itself, because before that, he was just giving like the history of Sepultura, the context of the re-recording, uh, quite a long time talking about like the production aspects. And I was like, no, like, how does it service the music? How does it... Are, are you going to say anything substantive about this? But the whole review was just basically describing the ephemera around the thing itself and it, it, that kind of just sums up the approach that these guys take um so yeah it really does do it just dumbs down metal and makes it a almost anti-intellectual uh pursuit in a lot of ways um but yeah moving on um what even is this it's just just tier listing because uh, we can't no, really no. lash out there, jason people no, in no, class no, no, no. <laughs> no 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 this this man should make you a little ashamed of your country Shelly. Okay. Let let me preface it. Okay. I I came across this guy's video and I tried watching some today and I I couldn't stomach it. But um, like six months ago, I was just cruising around. I I, I fucking perusing around and I found his fucking channel. And he's one of those, and that's why he has to be included as a Bradley Hall guy um because he has a massive following on youtube and all that but he comes from the perspective of not hacking as a musician in the real world therefore he's a youtuber musician criticizing other musicians and he might have some tips and tricks for guitarists out there that's his whole stick and he also offers a uh, guitar lessons online <laughs> and but his whole personality is you know it's like metal's fun metal's fun metal's fun oh, blah 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 and he doesn't it, I don't get any like seriousness, no gravitas, other than just like, yes, I've learned all these guitar techniques. And he has a fucking video of himself in corpse paint playing in like a SpongeBob SquarePants guitar. And just to be really ironic, and he, he had like a smiley face on his forehead rather than an inverted cross. And it's all just fun, fun, fun. It's like Teletubbies. It's like Teletubbies. <laughs> that's, that's what it is like. There's so no I've fucking across, substance to it. I've come across him on like uh, Instagram shorts and stuff where it's just little skits. And uh, some of them I found like, you know, I didn't I didn't laugh out loud, but I was like, that's mildly amusing. But I've not come across, I've not watched his YouTube channel. But what you're describing is what I would call lol random humor, where it's like just doing really kind of, well, yeah, random stuff to for the lols, basically. Uh, that I mean, I'm not going to pass, I'm going to take your word for it on like the substance of his YouTube channel, but that kind of sounds like what you're describing. My problem like, what with if we the play whole... black metal on a SpongeBob guitar, lol, random, like right. Yeah, my problem with the with the I don't take myself seriously approach is that it feels like a form of signaling to me. Um, you know, you're almost trying to assert your superiority to people who do take themselves seriously um, by loudly announcing to others that you don't. 
You know, it's uh, almost like uh, that Uriah Heat character uh, from that one book that I don't remember. You know, he's he's so humble, um, is how it always feels to me. Um, and this guy is guilty of that uh, in, in all accounts. And also, he's awful. Uh, watching him is <laughs> extremely painful. And he definitely, if you look to where his actual heart lies as far as what his tastes are through all of the veils of humor and irony, uh, he definitely is from that shredder guitar camp. That's what he prefers. And his five most effing underrated bands, they're all like bands that feature a lot of uh, technical, I suppose you could call it, uh, shred guitar, you know, um, which is. Uh, I guess somewhat ironically, um, a, a, a kind of music that's all about taking yourself seriously, taking your, your playing seriously, but that's also a frequent criticism of it, which may be why he's adopted this kind of humorous approach. You know, I, oh yeah, I love playing technical shred guitar and I love that kind of music, but don't worry. I don't, I don't think of, I don't take myself too seriously. I don't think myself superior because I like to play really fast shred guitar. I think myself superior because I don't take myself as seriously as you guys do. Yeah, and I'm not going to speak for the guy, but there is a British element to that in that we do really love self-deprecating humor in a lot of ways. And it is a self-defense mechanism in that we it means that we don't allow our real personality to come through so people can debase us for stuff that we're not really attached to and that really does come across in online content is like there's nothing there's nothing to attack here because we don't really know what this guy's like if everything he puts forward is humorous content and in a lot of ways that i do the same thing i don't take myself too seriously but i always very clear that i take the ideas and the concepts and the music that i'm engaging with seriously and you want if you want to have a serious disagreement about it then we can um but if you want to start attacking me it's like well that doesn't matter it, it like it's not a part of it's not up for discussion as like who i am as a person what's up for discussion is the music that we're discussing at a particular time or whatever's relevant whereas for the for this yeah i've come across this guy a lot just out and about in the scene where it's there's nothing wrong with having fun with the music absolutely like uh that is a huge part of it but if that's all you're doing then you are again you are having an overall net negative impact on the scene and the music in general because then you end up with bands like baby metal or steel pump or whatever where again it's just all it is is a set of memes and jokes and it's like well fine but uh it used to be uh, it used to be something more than that but anyway moving on oh <laughs> it's our friend <laughs> this guy this guy has a habit of saying a lot of stuff that I completely agree with in the most abrasive, aggressive way he possibly can. And also the most, like, low-budget way. Like, that Blood Incantation Sucks video, which is the one that exploded him on a certain sort of section of YouTube, um, you can't hear the recording that he's critiquing because he's recording, I think, through his laptop speakers onto this projection. He doesn't use any sort of video editing to play over a blood incantation song so you can actually hear what he's doing and a lot of his videos still do that now um well he does say in the videos like he doesn't bother with video editing or anything like that he's just there to discuss it and he doesn't write scripts he just kind of has an idea and just puts the camera up and starts talking which is kind of limiting in terms of like capturing more of an audience that he wants to you know get his ideas across to and it also makes him very, very impersonable to people that he might want to persuade. And I think that's the real problem I have with this approach is that generally I agree with most of the points that he's making. And in fact, he provides insight that I can't because he's a guitar player, he's a very accomplished guitar player, which I'm not. So he can point to things at the very you know, technical, like ontological level that I, I will have missed, but I know intuitively just as a fan that listens to a hell of a lot of this music. But he's not ingratiating himself to people that might not necessarily agree or might be on the fence about these ideas. Um, he's not doing it in a way that kind of pulls in people that might, yeah, just just might be amenable to it, but haven't really fought it through. He's being very, very abrasive about it. Um, 
that's my general take on on the scale it back guy yeah uh we had jerry on our podcast um and we tried to quite you know a bit with him about his approach and all that and I, i'm unsure like he he uh he took down the channel then brought it back and uh all that because he, he did get the ire from he, like he's not really convincing anyone um that blood can incantation actually sucks like uh he's getting the hate listens um and the redditor is going on there you know trashing him and uh and the people who go there and agree with him they're just you know he's just kind of reinforcing their own perspectives um and i totally concur that if he uh takes a less abrasive approach um and you know generally you know pre presents himself as a an approachable uh, uh figure um, then he might actually convince some people that blood incantation actually sucks, which they do, by the way, if you're listening to this and didn't know that. Um, but the, the, the mannerisms of, you know, coming across so abrasively, as you said, uh, really has this disconnect of him actually convincing anyone. Um, I do like his content too, and I've tried to keep up with his channel as, uh, you know, since he's been on the podcast, uh, Jerry, I hope you the, the best if you're listening to this and, uh, you know the, the approach is what you what, what do you want it to make it be so um it doesn't have to be if this is just your thing just to shit on shit be grumpy old man get off my lawn and not tell the the kids why uh, i mean you tell the kids why why but it's more like uh from coming from your own era than you know trying to approach their perspectives like uh, kids just want to play in their front yard because that's the only yard available or something like that so i don't know um but you know, i wish him the best uh tyler what are your thoughts on that skill to back guy you know in general kind of like shelly i like this guy to some extent uh i don't agree with everything he says but i like his approach he has a more critical approach he discusses deeper aspects of the music uh, I liked his Blood Incantation Sucks video because while it has a very abrasive title and premise, he really goes into some detail about what they do that differentiates them from uh, what in our arena we would call quality classic death metal. I think he compares them to uh, Incantation, for instance, Onward to Golgotha and talks about what that album does that Blood Incantation doesn't. Um, you know, that makes it an actually interesting composition. Um, so I appreciate him in that regard. I don't always agree with him. Uh, I know I, I think I've seen him get into some protracted debates in the comment section on uh, DMU, which we're going to talk about later. And he asks interesting questions, even if I don't uh, square with his position. Um, which I think is good. I think it's good to ask those kind of questions because those questions can suss out why uh, different people have the perspective that they do. And it actually can lead to a discussion about what music is and what it does. And uh, that's, really, that's really awesome that someone is doing that. I do agree with Shelley that his format is probably not going to accomplish much of injecting these ideas to uh not even just the mainstream but to other people who may be amenable to those ideas if they were uh presented to them he he's not going to find those people and those people aren't really going to find him um and that's a really tricky thing to navigate because the obvious answer to that is to make your uh, presentation a little bit more like all of those metal media uh, um, publications that are suck, to put it simply. <laughs> um, but um, and he doesn't have even like some other um, publications that we're going to discuss that are more abrasive, so to speak. He doesn't have the advantage of um, a sort of uh, storied history to give him some notoriety to lead to a wider viewership. Uh, but he, all in all, I think I have a positive view on him. I think that he is looking at things from a way that I would think is a, a good way, a good starting position at the very least. Yeah, he's kind of like the inverse of Banger TV in that they'll just be everything's great, everything's positive, everything's wonderful. 
and very superficially just affirm that. Whereas this guy is everything is awful and go into detail on why. And whilst I'm saying to like Banger TV, write some stink pieces, write some really heavy, like hard hitting criticism, you can go too far the other way. And I think that's what Scale It Back is doing in that I do sometimes wonder how much he engages with modern death metal beyond the really popular stuff because he does cover the more popular bands and rightfully has some very very well thought out criticisms of them and goes into detail on that which i is what i appreciate about it but i would like him to sometimes take i don't know like i know that we've discussed we have our differences on what's been quality in the last few years but if he took some artists that we thought have actually you know produced some pretty quality work in in say the last five years for instance and do some analysis of it it doesn't have to be a glowing positive banger tv style review but if he did some analysis on it and say this is what works this what doesn't um and that combined with say taking some more classic death metal and really going into detail on you know what was so like a uh, novel about suffocations approach or immolations approach and so on um i think he has done that a few times but it is buried under him just kind of you know it's a little bit old man yells at cloud in that he is just ripping to shreds everything that the kids love um which if you're trying to not preach to the choir and reach a wider audience you're yeah you're just not really going to get anywhere because you just look like you're just shitting on stuff because you're older uh, and you don't understand it anymore, which he clearly does, but that's the perception that you're you're giving off, I suppose. Okay, Jerry, we love you. Um, keep on keeping on. Uh, let's move to the next slides, Shelley. <laughs> Dietzini Bon Gibo. Uh, I don't hate this guy as much as you would think. Um, I have a similar opinion on him as I do the quietest. So obviously he's not a metal guy. Um, he covers mostly sort of hip-hop and pop music and indie rock from what i can sort of tell but he will occasionally do an absu album or an autopsy album and as you see there a liturgy album but he is sort of the quintessential hipster he got in on the ground in terms of youtube reviewing very early on um, and he's since gained a massive following i think i first came across him when he reviewed burzum's bellus back in 2010 Similar in a lot of ways to Banger TV in that Anthony Fantano will actually do negative reviews. He will criticize albums uh, to his credit, and he's quite stingy with his ratings at times. But similar to Banger TV, he won't talk about the music. He will give you some background on the band. He'll talk about the production. Um, he will throw around some not very precise adjectives on particular riffs, maybe. Uh, but you can as Tyler has mentioned a few times with the previous publications, you can go away from one of his reviews and just not know, have any idea what an album sounds like. He also subscribes to the, what I'll call the quote unquote common sense narrative of metal in general, and that it needs to be fixed or otherwise rehabilitated. Um, so he'll talk about, you know, your, your, your standard narrative of Opeth were progressive or deaf heaven have added something new to the form of black metal or, um, autopsy are uh, backward looking and basic um that kind of thing where he doesn't really analyze what was novel about autopsy at the time or he doesn't really analyze the fact that deaf heaven might not necessarily be relevant to black metal um but I think you could do a lot worse than this guy. I don't think he's the worst thing out there. I think he's more damaging by the fact that he is probably the biggest music reviewer on YouTube and he will be a lot of people's inroads into this music. And he speaks with a level of authority that he honestly does not have. When you see him do like a, a death metal starter pack and you see him crack out the carcass heart work or, um, you know, another recommendation for Left Hand Path or a My Dying Bride or he'll recommend uh, Slaughter of the Soul, that kind of thing, where it's just really very predictable um, surface-level understanding of what death metal is, but he'll try and speak with the authority of someone that understands the genre. And I think that's the most damaging aspect of his approach. But he's not dishonest, and he's not, like, ungenuine. You guys will probably have a harsher take, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over. All right, so Anthony Fantano is the guy who read uh, Invisible Oranges in the early days and took it seriously. <laughs> um, and his like, whole YouTube channel is like Invisible Oranges pers personified. Um, 
including the the Brooklyn vegan aspect. Obviously, metal is just a small portion of his musical intake, um, but his opinions on it tends to be very in league with like uh, the hipster publications and alternative alternative uh, media that we had discussed. Um, I, I I really can't sit through a, a review of his. Like you said, he doesn't really get to the meat and potatoes. Um, he kind of talks around things a lot and uh, kind of goes to the what the, the magazines go for is the personalities and the quirkiness of, you know, the, the musicians behind the music rather than just tackling the music head on. Um, and that the reason why he has such a large following is because a lot of people, they look at music as a form of adornment and this guy just supplements that for them. Um, it's just decoration for their personalities, and that's why he's blown up so large. Um, and I kind of get like the, you know, he does have a a more nuanced approach, um, a more intelligent approach here and there, but it doesn't actually get to the core of the music. Like you said, it's more about the production qualities of it and all that rather than talking about how, like, from a musicology standpoint, I should say. I'm, I have friends who are musicologists, and they're able to dissect music um, from the sheer aspect of the music itself. This guy doesn't have an ounce of that in him. Um, Tyler, go ahead. Anthony Fantano, he is a meme. Um, I kind of agree with Shelley in that he's really not the worst. He doesn't say things that outright irritate me or feel like they're contrived for the sake of making a social statement. There's a similar reviewer on YouTube, uh, the Punk Rock MBA, who's very guilty of that. He's yeah, really on a stand that guy. <laughs> Yeah, he's absolutely awful. He's on, He goes on a crusade, for instance, of insisting to people that butt rock is actually good. And okay, you might have a case for that. And he even made some points in that whole uh, debacle that were actual points. But I couldn't help but feel that overall, what he was actually trying to do is just uh, make a sort of social statement about how He's superior to others because he's going to like something that is almost universally agreed upon to be not good. And that's annoying. It's an annoying position to take because you, ne you never get an actual thorough response from people like that. If you try to address the point they're making, it's that, oh, you're just upset because you take your following like a sheep, the position that everyone else has, that this isn't good. Well, I'm not a sheep, I think for myself, and I actually think it's good. It's like, all right, thanks, man. We didn't actually get to talk about the music there. We just made like implications about each other's personalities. Um, Anthony Fantano doesn't do that. He actually talks about the music. I might not agree pretty much at all with what he has to say. I might think that a lot of the times he doesn't really say anything that substantial, but he does attempt to talk about the music. Um, I will say that addressing Shelley, uh, Shelley's point that he has that uh, position that metal needs to be fixed, yeah, that's an annoying position to have, and it's something that I've noted that he does before, uh, that he's done before. And it's annoying to me because I've always been really irritated by the notion that somehow metal becoming more like something else is fixing metal or doing something new. Like making metal sound more like shoegaze or more like classic rock or more like 70s progressive rock. Uh, why don't you just listen to those genres? How are you improving metal by making it sound like something other than itself? Don't you listen to metal precisely because it isn't those things, because it is what it is? That would be my main response to Anthony Fantano. Yeah, no, I, I think that pretty much pretty much covers him. Um, so, yeah, next up. Uh, I'd not come across the... Well, I think I had done because they're again a, a fairly substantial youtube channel in the metal kind of um arena but i, I d definitely don't follow their content on a regular basis um but from what i can see it's fairly uh like fairly factual sort of trivia based stuff where if you want a resource that will literally tell you what different 
forms of metal do or what the key releases are um, or what is going on in metal, then this seems to be a fairly good kind of uh, place to go for that. I'm not in need of that uh, myself, but I think, it, you know, as far as like meeting a need for people that just need like a bit of direction on what albums or what bands to check out, this seems like the place to go or am i am i missing something massively about these guys i i i think your your opinion is valid shelly um i i believe the heavy metallurgy guys um they are former uh, metal maniacs writers um so they they have a lot of skin in the game when it comes to uh uh metal um publication and all that um and i know there's a big overlap with those people with uh, a decibel magazine um, but they they tend to be more genuine um, than a lot of the other YouTube channels. Also know that uh, what was his name uh, Kellen or Killeen or whatever from a uh, Killing from for company. He's uh, heavily involved with these guys as well as Craig Zoller. Um, it really points to uh, the the metal maniacs, the old uh, guard, essentially for a mainstream metal publication here in the the u.s and they're just kind of reflecting on their times while they were writers and uh their opinions and a lot of what they say kind of resonate it resonates with us um and our own perspectives um even though we may uh, go a little bit further than they do but when it comes to youtube channels i think it's one of the, definitely one of the better ones out there um, I think they they come from an honest place. I think they truly do love metal for metal. Um, and as part of their being, it's so, something that's never really left them. And I, I saw a recent thing that uh, the guy from Killing from Com- Killing for Company posted uh, about uh, the heavy metallurgy guys. And uh, they're talking about the, the, the death metal bubble popping. And they're, they're open to talking about... You know, we we talk about the heyday of extreme metal and all that, and uh, they're open to things like that. They're it's not uh, just for clicks or anything like on a lot of the other YouTube channels. And I I, I, I do have a level of respect for these guys. I, again, I think we go a little bit further than they do, and uh, but I, I think when it comes to people wanting a good take on extreme metal, you can't go wrong with these guys. Really, I mean, they they may, you know not go as far as the the anusites and all of that and but well, that's fine not everyone has to go that far so overall i have a very positive opinion of them go ahead teller heavy metallurgy was pleasantly surprising in that regard i mean i watched a video of theirs that the guy had a uh, god macabre poster on the wall he talked about morgue's album eroded thoughts uh he had a lot of good opinions on a lot of albums that I agreed with him were classic, excellent albums. So yeah, it was a solid, uh, it was a solid experience, I would say. Um, Like Jason was saying, I don't know if they necessarily go into the greatest depth on the subject, but they definitely have the spirit and their heart is in the right place. So I don't have too much negative to comment on these guys. Uh, I think that they are uh, good, uh, sincere, uh, true-spirited uh, fans of heavy metal. Awesome. Uh, all right. All right, you Shelley, you want, I want to introduce Reddit? Uh, I do not want to introduce Reddit, but I guess we've made our own bed here. So shitty Redditors, shitty Facebook. Um, and we were going to include, include Twitter in this, but uh, Jason didn't want to put himself through going through metal Twitter, such as it is at the moment. Um, I, I'm not on Reddit. Um, I only come across it um, when it is on a Google search that I do. Um, all I will say is it's really just dependent on the thread that you land on. Some of it's really banal. Some of it can actually be quite uh, interesting. Uh, some of it is, is like, I don't know, the most weirdly specific um well yeah just look at i mean if you're on the youtube just look at what you can see on the <laughs> just sorry i'm reading that one where it's black bands like black magic ss i can listen to without the nazi shit i read that as i'm looking for bands uh without when you said without nazi ties i read that as 
like ties as in uh, suit and tie. So I was like, why would they want a band that doesn't wear Nazi ties? Um, sorry, I was just having a brain fart moment. Um, let me pour a beer. <laughs> I'm on number five. The group think is definitely powerful here. I was talking about signaling earlier, like when you try to signal that you don't take yourself seriously. That's all this is. I'd hate to say it. It's not me taking a political position. It's not about politics. This is a social phenomenon of people trying to convince each other and perhaps themselves that they are holier than thou. Um, you know, that they listen to the right stuff. And that's the death knell of creativity, in my opinion. I know some people get really angry about that. And I don't know, you're enabling extremism by doing that or whatever. It sounds suspiciously similar to me to old boomer Christians tell me, telling me maybe they would use different language that I'm enabling Satanism by not promoting uh, a strict censorship of music along religious terms, and I, which I also feel is like an older form of social signaling. Well, no, I've I've discussed this at length. Um, well, I think we've discussed it at length on here on previous episodes, but also my blog. Like uh, the fact that people use art not as a way to challenge themselves or to understand the world around them or their own experience but more as a way, as you said, to either signal to other people or as a way to consume content or as a form of like activism because they don't have any other outlets for their particular worldview or like their political beliefs. Uh, so the art that they consume is the one area that they feel like they can control in a moral sense what is going on. Um, and obviously it's not for me to say what, records people buy what bands people support you can do what you like but if you're doing it just to reaffirm your own worldview and to not be challenged or otherwise made to feel uncomfortable then you're not listening to metal particularly extreme metal for the right reasons and the moment you start going online and telling other people off for that kind of behavior you are again you're dumbing down metal you're watering it down with something that doesn't necessarily belong there i totally get the discomfort people feel about the presence of far-right groups for instance within certain scenes and i think to some extent that's almost a separate thing it's that's to do with the social element of being a metalhead um where there might be i'm just going to caveat this because i'm not sure you guys will give it there might be a place for activism but in terms of like the art that you listen to, and Burzum's probably the you know the archetype example, not just because it's the most well known artist, but because Burzum was not an NS band. It's not explicitly Nazi at any point. It's just Varg is a bit of a, a fruitcake. Um, but then you know just people agonise over how to approach his art um, to you know in a way that makes them feel comfortable. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, if you're going to Burzum to feel comforted, you're doing it for all of the wrong reasons. Like, what the fuck are you even doing listening to black metal? And that's where you end up with bands like uh, Deaf Heaven or Alcest or whatever. That's, <laughs> you know, you get Coldplay with distorted guitars where it's like, that's that's the end result of you trying to moralize the artistic consumption that you do. And yeah, you, you see that play out on Reddit, but a lot of it is barely a step above what you see on the Metal Archives forum, which is just list bands with x or list bands that sound like y or what are your top 10 albums for this and it, or it's always like either weirdly specific totally meaningless or you can just google this now there's no need to start a thread on these particular topics uh so yeah that that's my take but some reddit threads can be quite engaging you do get some interesting ideas buried in the bowels of some of those threads right um so i've gone viral on reddit before um from a troll post that i did about dungeon synth and it, it was just like hundreds and hundreds of comments of people taking it seriously and it was obviously a troll and i'm just so dumbfounded that we talk about group thinking all that that s some people are such in a frame of mind that they're unable to actually realize what they're reading is satire um and that is right it as a whole it's you know group think um revved up and overdrive and it, right it's just accessible to me so um that's why i included it on this uh, iceberg tyler go ahead well why would you think critically about something being satire 
and miss the opportunity to make a statement about you having the right opinion. You know, all of those people who took that post seriously were, you could say, on your side, like, how could this man's mother not allow him to make the kind of music he likes? How could she have these ridiculous opinions about music, about gnomes being satanic? Um, but yeah, they were all not thinking critically about it and not seeing that it was satire, I believe, because they wanted an opportunity to voice that they had the right opinion. Uh, to t go back to what Shelley was saying about, can you uh, recommend me bands that are similar to Burzum but aren't problematic? Uh, and to kind of repeat a point I made earlier, yeah, it sounds a lot like, hey, can you make me a Christian version of metal? Uh, we need we need Striper because, you know, I like metal, but I can't listen to uh, Shout at the Devil because, you know, uh, it's got like kind of a pro-devil sentiment there. So I need a safe form of it. Um, it's a point I like to bring up because a lot of this group of people really don't like Christians. And so, yeah, there's a petty part of me that gets a little bit of an enjoyment out of comparing them to them. But I think the comparison is apt, at least in part. Well, yeah, it's, it's the it's the moralizing of other people's behavior. And again, I you know, have absolutely no problem with people having a moral code. I have absolutely no problem with people discussing that moral code. But when it comes to not being able to discuss it without the, as you said, the signaling, where it's just, it becomes a simple binary. You are either with us or you're against us. And there's no room for nuance uh, on these on these threads. And I think that's the real problem with a lot of social media in general. Um, moving on, we have what? Uh, where are we, Jason? <laughs> Facebook. This is Facebook. <laughs> I don't. I'm not on Facebook anymore. I forgot what it looks like. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, really large extreme metal groups on Facebook, and <laughs> as you can see, uh, I just took a screen cap of one guy saying in a black metal group, "Does anyone listen to Behemoth?" And <laughs> <laughs> and I think that summarizes uh, quite a bit of the how people exchange information in these groups. Um, is no nuance. We we can say uh, words that aren't polite, but I'll just say there's no nuance to these conversations. I know uh, John, as you pronounce his name from Samoth, he complained about the group. Uh, Order of the Black Arts. Um, I think they're one of the better groups out there, honestly. But still, it's it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> like this is, I, I put a lemming there for a reason. This lemming stuff. You everyone runs in one direction and jumps off a cliff, um, just because you know it's the the modus operandi of those specific groups. So yeah, it's when I, when I look at these groups on Facebook, it's. Usually the the bottom feeders um, doing the bottom bottom feedering, uh, the headbangers trough types of uh, consumers out there. So uh, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, my experience with uh, Facebook groups devoted to heavy metal is some of the groups like this, but a lot of the meme groups definitely are almost entirely focused around socializing. They're oftentimes really centered on making a certain point about metal uh one of the really popular ones is second wave of black metal sucks it's all garbage first wave of black metal is where it's at but their point almost always boils down to you're a nerd or you're not cool for liking that and i don't care <laughs> i just don't care what kind of person you are how cool you are for liking this or how not cool you are for liking that it doesn't tell me anything about the music and it's boring you know, you can come up with however many witty one-liners you want. Uh, at the end of the day, all it amounts to is you telling me that you think you're cool and you think these other people aren't cool. And that's the most useless information to me that you could possibly give me. Um, I know a lot of these people will make some kind of jokes about, oh, he's just saying that because he himself is a nerd. That's not cool. I don't care. I don't care. You're wasting your time. <laughs> you're just spitting... You're just spitting random words into the air for no reason. I think there was a time when Facebook had the the groups in particular had the potential to 
have that element where you're building more of a community almost like like a replacement for the internet forums of old um but the way that facebook has kind of developed over the years has made that much more difficult and i think the most recent interactions i've had with that have been via the dungeon synth groups where most of it's just fairly functional it's just people sharing new releases recommendations things like that but the problem you get is repetition so for instance again to reference the metal archives forum they're pretty on it with if someone reposts a repeat thread or something that's very similar to a previous discussion they'll just link them to that and then get rid of the thread um policing an admin group uh, a facebook group as an admin is much more time consuming and difficult um so there's one that i'm on and just is a really like uh, banal example but it's just uh, terrible 80s metal album covers and it can be quite funny because you do see some really awful album art and it's it's amusing but for instance pantera's power metal will come up there once a week and there's no kind of the admins aren't policing any of that and all the comments will be oh we had this like less than a month ago or whatever and it's like well a why are you getting angry it's a facebook group where we're just posting silly album covers b like that's kind of sums up the problem with a lot of this where people are just posting the same requests the same things like that guy who listens to behemoth like uh, why what what purpose does that post serve have they googled behemoth like what why do you listen to behemoth what albums are you talking about in what context that's in the black metal group too that's in the black metal group and they put like the later behemoth image on there it's just well, so yeah, removed it from black metal that uh it's it's, it's that's why i have the lemming there for this but, yeah there's no there's no purpose to that request though it's okay uh, who listens to Behemoth? These are the albums that I prefer. These are my opinions on them. What are your opinions on them? That serves a purpose. But just who listens to Behemoth? If it was some obscure band that no one's heard of, fine. But one of the biggest extreme metal bands of their generation. <laughs> like, of course, like, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Um, yeah. Uh, so social media, I was going to include Twitter, but I just did not have the time and energy to go through it. And we have run on pretty long today. So let's definitely jump into the blogs the first one being a uh, no clean singing which i've had islander the guy who runs the website on this podcast as well as i have written like 20 or 30 articles for this website however um i do have some criticisms islander if you're listening my my criticism is is everything's a little too positive like it just seems like you guys latch on to you know things everything that comes towards you and you write pos you know positive reviews about everything when in reality um you, you, you have to have like a critical eye and if something's not good you have to tell people that it's not good and i i do admire his use of adjectives no one like i think only hp lovecraft has used such great adjectives as you know the islander guy who runs this website but again, it's like I appreciate the the format for me to write um, on extreme metal um, here and there on you know for things that aren't really suitable for other publications. I, no clean singing is my go to for that. However, I, I understand they have a pretty big following nowadays, and it's I, I think it's part of the uh, the promo blitz that you know a PR company sends out the Holux page. And they, they just write a quick, you know, positive review of it and move on to the next thing and positive review. And so if everything is positive, I, I talk about Arthur Schopenhauer a lot, but we're talking about like a utopia here where, and Arthur Schopenhauer said, if the whole world was like, you know, luxury and roasted chickens just flying to you, just take a bite out of it, you know, and, you know, get your protein that way. Um, it would be fucking boring as hell. And that's what Schopenhauer's criticism of uh, Utopia is. And I think uh, No Clean Singing definitely uh, tries to cater to a more utopic type of view of extreme metal. Um, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, I will say No Clean Singing is definitely above average. If there's an album, a new album knocking around that's on my radar, I will definitely go to see if they've covered it and I'll be interested in the review of it and that in the context of what we're talking about here is probably the highest praise that i could give it i think what you've noted jason is something i have noted about this site as well 
the promo blitz thing they they do a lot of premier track premieres um and i get either requests through Horlicks or direct requests it's like oh we've got a new track off our album coming out do you want to premiere it on your uh site uh never never do that my site is for me posting my opinions on music you know, it's you not premiered me you premiered my I... last good craft album but you're one of the only people I would ever do that for. Um, I would not do it for bands that I even know online or whatever, um, generally speaking, because my site is not for marketing. And I think that's the problem that No Clean Singing is having at the moment is there's a clear incentive to do it because it drives traffic and it's it's you know basically content that you don't really have to write around. But for me, it's whenever I'm featuring music on my website, it will have my opinion on the music front and center because that's what my website is for. If you want to listen to the track, go and find it somewhere. Go to Bandcamp, go to YouTube, whatever. Um, and I think that's the problem that No Clean Singing is starting to sink into, in that there's still the reviews, the writing is great. I do agree it's too positive at times, and it does sometimes devolve into word salad, but it's definitely above average as far as like the quality of the critique goes. But... Uh, yeah it does sort of it has started to do too many you know track premiere from this band uh exclusively at no clean singing or whatever which is kind of the first step down a down the slippery slope uh i would uh, say decibel's um, been doing that too um but well, yeah but I decibel's do have a, a huge a huge magazine no clean singing is it's a big blog it's far bigger than mine but it's still like it's independent as far as what we're talking about yeah they don't have any advertisements so it is a, a passion for no clean singing so that's commendable in itself i just wish there was more of like a critical eye um on no clean singing um if there's something that the reviewer doesn't like about an album you can say that you don't have to talk around it um tyler go ahead above average is a pretty good uh assessment of the this this blog i think in particular um it is pretty good writing um, it's some of the better, best out of what we've covered so far. Um, but I agree with you, Jason. I feel like if they're looking to push themselves into the strata up above, above average, they would need to start having a little bit more critical analysis. Uh, otherwise, the problem that you can run into, and I think this is even sort of a, a positive uh, perspective on the site, is that you have a flood, uh, uh, just a vast sea of material, um, and you can get lost in it. You know, it's difficult to distinguish which of these do I actually want to listen to um, if your uh, site is kind of serving as somewhat of a tastemaker site, which a lot of these passion projects, consciously or unconsciously, that's what they're doing. Uh, you know, it's difficult for the reader to discern what they actually want to listen to because you have a massive amount of material, a massive amount of albums that you've covered, and you've given all of them positive reviews. Yeah, I think that that's the problem with sinking into that um, that mindset is, yeah, you, you the main function of your site kind of disappears. If people are going there to get a an opinion they respect on a particular album and find out maybe find out some new recommendations as well if you just start giving the same perspective on every release that comes out then you will start to lose that trust but yeah as we've mentioned this is sort of within the context no clean no clean singing is far superior to the majority of stuff we've covered so far um in that regard and the writing is still very very thoughtful um as and knowledgeable as far as like what they're covering um so moving on, um, I added Astral Noise because, again, they're sort of on a similar level. I think I don't think they're quite as big as No Clean Singing, um, but they're quite a big voice in the black metal, comic, extreme metal, lefty kind of sphere, especially within the UK. Um, and a lot of what they cover is music that I'm not interested in. There'll be a lot of post-metal um a lot of black gays that kind of thing where it's just well i could get angry about it and read it and just be fuming but there's no point in me wasting my time on that uh but what they do is as we were discussing with the reddit threads they very much lean into signaling that art is for um displaying your moral uh persona rather than art that you are interested in from a more challenging or critical perspective you can read some of their articles and replace the 
names of some of the bands and it will sound more like a shopping list um for people that don't want to you know that people want to boycott a certain nation or whatever it's very much just consumer advice after a time there is like substantive cultural analysis on there but their whole agenda is very much um making sure that whoever reads it doesn't touch certain products and doesn't financially support certain institutions they don't come at it from the angle of someone that is interested in criticizing or understanding art on its own terms they're very much interested in basically providing consumer advice i think that's how i put it in its most polite guise yeah, so uh, a, a fellow that we both know, David Burke. Um, I've, I, we've had him on the podcast. I know you've met him in person. I've met him in person, and uh, when I met him, uh, I was in London on a. I forget what was going on, but you weren't hanging out that day with me, and I met up with David Burke, and uh, we had a really good conversation. I really liked the guy a lot, and. Uh, he, I think he needs a more prominent uh, presence in the extreme metal scene, um, whether it's through you know this astral noise blog or some other well, format. I, I, like, just to say, I don't think he runs it. He's contributed articles before, but I don't think he's responsible for like the day to day running of the site. He's just like a guest writer that comes in now and then. I think. Yeah. I will, well, anyway, I, I'll say that's one of the more positive things to, to say about the the website is that. Uh, David Burke is a contributor, um, whether it's being a guest or whatnot. But uh, um, I looked at the website and I, I immediately saw like a liturgy thing. So um, that immediately uh, made me click away. So I haven't really investigated as deep as you have. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my two thought, you know, two cents on that. Uh, I, I do hope David Burke the best. I know he wants me to be his rival. <laughs> He'll go get his PhD, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the existentialism of metal versus the uh, deterministic aspects of it. So I'm looking forward to that and him becoming my rival. And um, I n nothing but good things to say about him, even though I may not uh, agree with him on a lot of different things. So, uh, Teller, go ahead. I was fairly impressed with the writing on Astral Noise. It was a step above a lot of the other material that I read uh, for this episode. Obviously, I don't like the material they cover for the most part, um, but the writing was uh, surprisingly competent. Um, yeah, I do think that, as uh, Shelley pointed out, that there is an element definitely of using the music as some form of adornment, even if it's not for moralistic or political reasons. You can also do the same thing for personal reasons, you know, touting the value of an album being how it conveys uh, aspects of your personal life. And you definitely can run into that with uh, mediums that, fo that are uh, focused on post black metal or. Uh, anything of that kind of nature but yeah i guess the most i can say for it is they do have some apparently fairly decent writers working for them people of some level of intellect who can know how to uh string some sentences together so uh, as faint praise as that is that's about all i've got to say about astral noise cool all right moving on we have angry metal guy uh I've not checked out this guy in, in fucking years. What's your take, Jason? My take is that uh, he's a pretty good writer. Um, he, he has written about me, and he has uh, criticized, like, I tend to be quite lofty in my write-ups about the releases, and I'm probably one of the only uh, projects on I Avoid Hanger Records who actually writes his own uh, bios and all that um, about the the release and you know the promo and all that. I'll write it myself and I use this. And he's criticized me for being too lofty in that regard. And I I do want to say thank you. Um, at least someone noticed that out there that I tend to be quite overwrought when describing my own music to try to catch you know interests. But I don't think it goes far enough. I know we said about some other blogs and all that, and I just don't think it goes far enough. Um, 
he he is a really good writer. I don't know if it's crew or one person or what, but he is a, a good writer, and I commend him on that. Um, his uh, articles are fun to read. Um, they might have actual some substance to the analyses, um, but I, I don't know if he's as deep as we are. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't hate him. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Tyler. Yeah, this guy was probably one of the lesser ones out of the blog spot um, metal publications for me. Uh, well, this guy, I think there's several people writing on the website. Um, it's uh, not relevant to the quality of the content there at all. But the first thing I noticed when I went here, because uh, I haven't really uh, seen this site's material before, was that the uh, logo for the site was um, imitating, uh, I think, a uh, logo for, I wanted to say amorphous, maybe it's that one melodic death metal group, Nea Obliviscaris or something. One of those kind of groups that I'm not particularly fond of. So that already kind of skewed my perspective a little bit. But I did read through some of their reviews, and yes, it is competent writing, uh, but also at the same time, there were more elements than some of the other entries here in like the blog spot section, so to speak, um, that were guilty of giving me a lot of uh, visual dis uh, visual sort of metaphors for the music without really describing too much what the music actually does. Um, and that might kind of play into what Jason was saying about how they don't go as deep as people like ourselves do. But it wasn't the it definitely wasn't the worst offender of that style by far where uh, the, it's just a stream of nonsense. You know, there is definitely a sort of uh, through idea in their reviews. So uh, it is of, uh, that might just be a general theme amongst these blog spot entries, but they, they do have somewhat of a higher quality control than uh, some of the more major publications do. Yeah, I think it partly depends on what you're going to these publications for. Like, if you're going for recommendations and you want a, an opinion that you trust, um, I think Angry Metal Guy is probably, like, does really serve a purpose there. Um, my, I, myself, I don't really do that with blogs or publications in general. I get my recommendations from, like, other sources. Uh, but then again, if you want like opinions or analysis on music that you know really well and you just want to read some really good thought-provoking writing on it that might give a different perspective then um maybe don't go to these publications but that's not to say that's a problem with them they're not really aiming to do that they are going through new releases and giving their like opinions on them and as tyler said they are giving a coherent like um coherent analysis of it even if it doesn't necessarily go as deep as we would do but that's not a bad thing not many people do go as deep as we do on some of this stuff um and if you are just looking for a resource to kind of you know go through all the churn of crap that comes out every week to get to something of quality then i think again that's you know no clean singing angry metal guy and uh to some extent um well maybe not astral noise because what they review is god awful but they're interesting more as a <laughs> as an entity rather than the music that they cover but the next one is definitely a resource that you could go to uh, particularly if you're in the more sort of underground black metal death metal milieu the mystification zine formerly grizzly butts um i don't know how this guy does it as far as the sheer amount of material he gets through and also the fact that he has a very idiosyncratic writing style um it's very very strange uncanny writing um but and i respect it like he really does like he's like a machine in terms of the amount of stuff that he can get for and the amount of um the fact that he can stick with writing very very entertaining reviews in their own right as separate from the music that he's covering stuff that writing that i enjoy reading in its own it's sort of if you want to know about the art of music criticism this guy kind of has it down but he does suffer from the same problem as no clean singing in a lot of ways, and that he, I guess this is me maybe being a bit too judgmental, but he tends to review a lot of stuff, either positively or not negatively, that I would not even touch. Either it was too boring, too derivative, 
or whatever and it goes straight in the bin for me whereas this guy just covers everything um from certain labels uh and from certain kind of a certain level of underground black and death metal um so again if you want a resource that helps you navigate that um environment then absolutely this is the guy um but if you want just the cream of the crop uh he won't necessarily do that he will give you basically everything and uh, you know a lot of it will be okay um average um and only a few a handful will be like actually worth checking out in my opinion but you might not necessarily get that from his reviews but in terms of just the art of reviewing um i think this guy is sort of definitely up there as like uh, blogs and zines that i um i respect uh so yeah jason jason what's your thoughts so um i have actually chatted with uh the grizzly butts guy and i think it's really cool shit um uh, yes he does have a very idiosyncratic style of writing um and but i also know that he spends a lot of time with the releases so it's not you're talking about how some publications like how the fuck do they listen to it you know all this shit like banger tv and you know keep revisiting it he listens to the shit for like a week or two weeks you know re repeated listens before he writes about it he wants to understand the content and all that which is better than what a lot of publications really do honestly a lot of them just they take the surface aspects of the music like the production and all that and they kind of just like do uh, the personality and quirks about the characters involved and that's that's a wrap that's the article he actually spends time with uh the content that he writes about and that's very commendable and it's like you do shelly i understand you really do delve into the the content um so yeah i i think uh overall he is one of the better positive voices in the blog sphere um but yeah he does write about some stuff that is not in uh what i would personally listen to so there's that so tyler go ahead another one that i was pleasantly surprised by the quality of the writing uh the reviews that i read here had a personal touch that lent a degree of charm to them um you got a feeling that this person was the reviewer was listening to the album intently and giving you their experience of listening to the album uh you know almost as it was playing out before them and that's pretty commendable in modern metal journalism uh like has already been said about many of the other blog spots and uh by jason and shelley about this one in particular is the sheer dearth of material uh and the fact that they tend to almost solely focus on what they find on the, what they find to be uh good material it makes it uh, almost an overload of information for the reader you're not going to really be able to discern between which of these is something that you should really stick with that's going to be valuable for repeated listens and which are maybe nailing some aesthetic aspects or nailing some songwriting aspects but while they're commendable for that reason they're not really a long-term listen maybe just interesting um so because of that i think that's a somewhat of a downgrade for this website and if it wanted to sort of push itself into being something that was uh above you know above the rest of the herd it would need to apply a little bit more of a critical analysis yeah i think that pretty much that pretty much sums it up um but yeah definitely one of the my go-to's again much like no clean singing when there's a, an album on my radar and i'm curious about how it's landing with other people he's one of the the first ones i'll check out as far as like i know i'm going to get an interesting read if nothing else um and they're en they're entertaining and thoughtful to read in their own right independently of uh the music itself so yeah and yeah definitely like respectable as terms of like just the sheer work ethic of it as well um cool so that was the blogosphere uh and now we're down to the underground uh so this is the very very ground floor of um uh what would you call independent music coverage 
Uh, no, not beholden to any algorithms, not beholden to marketing, not beholden to ad revenue, anything like that. Uh, people that can just spout their opinions and not really worry about the consequences all that much. Um, so, old disgruntled bastard, uh, Tyler and I were chatting before um, we started recording, and I just, I totally forgot that I ripped this guy's format off in that one of the main things he does is taking two albums, similar style, similar era, and he'll kind of compare and contrast them and grade them. And I basically wrote my incomplete history of extreme metal series, ripping off that format. Although he does it in a much more quantitative way. He'll categorize each element of the album, go through what each album does, and then sort of grade them on different aspects and then total it up at the end to sort of say which one is possibly superior. I don't, I don't do that with my reviews in general. I don't do a quantitative, um, rating i i don't really like star ratings i don't like the percentage rating on metal archives i do it because you have to to submit a review but in general i think if you need that star rating um and you didn't get it from the writing itself then uh the review wasn't properly written but this definitely serves a purpose and it is definitely entertaining to read um and it's very much in that thing of what i mentioned earlier is you might know the albums he's discussing really well um because they're often like old classic albums and stuff but you're getting a really interesting piece of analysis and maybe he's coming at it from angles that you didn't necessarily consider before um so i'll freely admit this guy has definitely been a big influence on on my writing um and yeah just all around quality stuff it's just a shame that he doesn't seem to have posted anything for a few years now um for what i could see but um yeah definitely a lot of quality stuff on there as far as like just cream of the crop metal writing goes yeah, and uh, there's there's a, a an element that I don't know if you know about Philly um, with the old disgruntled bastard is that he's from India and um, he has like the Indian perspective on a lot of different things and just loves metal. And I've met a few people in India. I mean, online at least who uh, they're they're they they're of the same uh, flock as we are. And uh, I, I've really thoroughly enjoyed his articles. Um, yeah, like we say, uh, it's like he's willing to criticize things and show a spade as a spade and get to the nitty gritty of the, the subject matter and is very commendable. Um, and one of the best uh, metal blogs out there. Um, different from the blog sphere, because I think the blog sphere, they're trying to catch like a a larger audience. Um, we're in the territory of the underground where people don't really care about catching a larger audience. They just want to talk about the substance. And when it comes to the, the three, uh, three publications in this layer of the iceberg, um, it definitely deserves its place in it. Tell her, go ahead. Old disgruntled bastard is, uh, awesome. The, he's had some truly profound insights, and uh, like the other publications in this tier, he does an excellent job of presenting a seemingly complex idea in a way that can be dissected and understood by anybody with at least some modicum of critical thinking. Uh, I remember very fondly, and I think it's an article that is not actually on the website anymore. Uh, a piece he wrote about what elitism actually is and the positive value of it. And it was one of the most ingenious explanations of the concept I'd ever heard. It's a hot button topic in heavy metal in particular, because a frequent complaint about metal heads and heavy metal in general is that they're highly elitist and people use it as a sort of a pejorative, an, an insult. And he gave a very detailed explanation of why it's actually the opposite of that and why elitism is one of the contributing factors to heavy metal having its distinct and endearing character. So I have nothing but praise uh, for this writer. He, he's definitely one of the top tier in metal journalism. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just to add, yeah, to add to what Jason said about the difference between this and something like Grizzly Butts, in that although I massively respect Grizzly Butts guy as, as a writer, um, there is, I think, one of the reasons why he tends to cover far more releases than I would do is partly because he is very, um, 
he does have one eye on growing his following. I'm not saying that's what he's interested in. He's he is very knowledgeable and very passionate about the subject, but he is also very like social media savvy. He knows how to build um his following and stuff. Whereas all disgruntled bastard, you can tell that he doesn't really have any skin in that game. He's just posting his opinions online, and if if someone te- you know someone chimes with it, fair enough. If they don't, whatever. Um, whereas Mystification Zine is still kind of playing the game to some extent. But at the moment, as things stand, he's not sacrificed his integrity as a writer or a critic uh, for the sake of that. Whereas maybe someone like No Clean Singing is on the precipice, uh, but there's still like much quality content there. But yeah, that's the real difference between this tier and um, the tier above it. So yeah, uh, moving on. Um, I'm I'm not going to say anything about that because that would just be embarrassing. If you guys do. <laughs> yeah, it's time for Shelly to talk about his own website. <laughs> so, uh, everything that we said about Old Discernal Bastard can be said about uh, Hate Meditations. Um, I was drawn to Shelly um, early on because of his website and the honest opinions. Granted, we do have different political opinions, but... Honestly, at this point in my life, I am not brave enough for politics. Quote me on that. I am not brave enough for politics. I do not want that to be a factor in my life. I just want to fucking enjoy fucking art, okay? And uh, I think Shelly comes from the same space, you know, same type of format where if it's good, it should be celebrated. If it's bad, it should be trash. And let's celebrate the good um, while, you know, discarding the lemmings and all that of the mainstream media um i i I love his write-ups granted it is a very english so if you're not an anglophile you may not appreciate the 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 like i hate that word whilst um and any american who says that you suck at life because you're too much of an anglophile but he does use the word uh whilst you know whilst this is good and bad blah 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 blah. and uh sorry what do you what do you say in america then when you want to say while while oh (laughs) we also don't spell color with a u no no someone's commented on one of my articles like that before uh when they tried to correct me i was like mate i'm english we spell it with a u (laughs) <laughs> but, but yeah he's a he's a the co-host for this podcast for a reason um and it's because of his writing and the honesty that he puts out and um he's you know just like old discarnal bastard he's willing to call a spade a spade and uh put forth genuine thoughts on uh the authenticity of what he encounters so um, very commendable writer. Um, I hope he keeps going, and I hope he gains more traction. So uh, that's my thoughts on uh, hate meditations. Go ahead, Tyler. A topic that we, or a sort of uh, point that we've made in discussing many of these publications is the lack of critical analysis, the lack of the ability to make uh, criticism of what the metal scene is in general, or of uh, particular albums and talking about old disgruntled bastard having pieces where he discusses things like the place of elitism in metal hate meditations uh shelley in particular has actually penned an article on precisely that subject <laughs> about um what the place of critical analysis is in metal and why the fact that it's sorely lacking in a lot of commentary on metal is a problem um and I think that speaks to the quality of hate meditations, much like uh, the other uh, websites in this tier. Um, hate meditations doesn't just like metal simply for the aesthetic of being metal, you know, for distorted guitars and distorted vocals or whatever other aesthetic elements are considered part of metal. Like, oh, that's just the flavor of food that I like. Hate meditations is actually going to make critical analysis of metal and not only make critical analysis but do so in a way that is functional in a way that they can take as i said before about uh, odb um that they can take a seemingly complex idea and explicate it in a manner that 
someone can understand, even if they're coming to that subject with no prior experience or knowledge, so long as they're able to think with some degree of uh, critical thought. So in that regard, uh, like the other uh, websites in this tier, Hey Meditations is one of the best uh, publications of metal journalism online, in my personal opinion. I know I probably sound biased because I do a podcast with uh, the editor, I suppose you can say, the lead writer of Hate Meditations, but that is my honest opinion. I held that opinion long before I ever started doing this podcast. Uh, Shelly and I were talking before we started recording about how I first came across Hate Meditations reviews when uh, Hate Reading Metal Archives. I would read Metal Archives for the dumb opinions they had on albums that I liked or albums that I didn't like. Um, and I would come across Hate Meditations reviews that were posted there. And I thought, wow, these reviews are really thoughtfully and well-written. I don't know who this guy is, but he's a step above everybody else, pretty much, on this website. And it was after reading several of them, I noticed that they were all linked back to the Hate Meditations website, which was a really um, pleasant surprise. I was really happy to see that there was a website dedicated to uh, critical analysis of heavy metal as a genre, because up until that point, the only website pretty much that I felt really did that at all was the uh, next website that we're going to talk about. All right, hey, Shelley, introduce, introduce the um, next website. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about heavy meditations other than the fact that I'm not here to be all... All of these other sites are shit, and I do it right. I have very high um, expectations of what proper metal criticism and music journalism should be, but I freely admit that I don't always meet those expectations. It's just what I aspire to. Um, so uh, in my own like imperfect way, that's just what I do. But I'm not right 100% of the time. Not every review I've written has been gold. It's just... Um, if you like, yeah, if you vibe with it, that's excellent. And what, yeah, what you guys have said has been very, very kind. Uh, but yeah, I'm not here to be, I do it right. And here's how it should be done. It's just, this is what I think it could be if we actually applied ourselves to this, this process, um, which does lead us to the final site that we will be talking about, which, um, I don't think is without its issues. Um, and I do think it has declined a lot in the last decade, probably more. Um, but I don't make any secrets of the fact that this is sort of this was my tastemaker. I mentioned earlier on that I got a, a accidental like free CD with Kerrang and I started listening to Arch Enemy. It wasn't long after that and spending some time on the internet that I discovered um, Death Metal Underground, as was Anus.com, and. Uh, just you know started trawling through all of their reviews and their forum and all of the recommendations and that basically formed my entire outlook on metal for the next 15 years or so um and then in the mid 2010s i did break with it a lot um partially on the political lines i didn't like the politicization and of the fact that i was moving more left wing and i couldn't square that with my opinions on on this site but I've kind of reconciled myself to it in a lot of ways in that I think that the contribution this website has had to the way that we understand extreme metal, not just like how to write about it and how to communicate what the music is conveying and what it stands for, but extreme metal itself as an, as an event, as a thing that happened in the late eighties and early nineties, I don't think it can be I think it's I don't think it'd be undervalued and I think people dismiss it because they don't want to touch the you know the toxic political elements to it but I think if you if you were able to segment that separate that in your mind and genuinely engage with what this site did as far as like understanding uh, what for instance black metal was like what the fuck it was about this website cannot be bettered um and yeah, some of some of the reviews sometimes are too abstract for their own good. They are some of the densest writing you will see on extreme metal, and they reward repeated reads. Um, but once you sort of wrap your head around the writing style, and it probably helps to be listening to the music at the same time, um, you you do kind of come away. It probably sounds a bit corny and like cheesy to say it, but you just come away with a very different perspective on this music, and it it 
it will never appear in the same way again. And I think that's why this the reputation of this site won't go away. And a lot of these sites that we've been talking about have been spin-offs. I mean, I make no secret about the fact that Hate Meditations is essentially a spin-off of this um, because I was on the forums back in the day. Um, and I, yeah, I, I condemn a lot of the like weird sort of early alt-right political kind of stuff that went on. And a lot of, you did get a lot of really toxic personalities on there. But like I said, if you can sort of separate that and genuinely look at what it did for our understanding of extreme metal, um, it stands as like a testament to what this music was capable of, what it could be, and just um, how you, how to listen to extreme metal and how to approach some of these albums, I think that's that's really what it's what it continues to do for me i don't visit it anymore because i don't think it has anything more to add to my understanding um especially because we aren't really seeing any new releases that are worth analyzing in that depth and all of the classic albums i've already kind of absorbed the information so that for that reason i don't really revisit it anymore uh but the contribution it made is still is still there and it's still influencing what i do uh jason what what are your thoughts yeah um very storied um lineage with my myself and this uh anus death org um publication uh we've talked quite a bit about how alan moses was really the guiding force for my discovery of death and black metal he worked for morbid angel um he brought in i was 12 years old he brought in uh his cds i had my little walkman and they were signed by the band from Morbid Angel. And when I, when I moved to Texas, um, he wrote a two-page list of albums for me to check out. All of the fucking classics that we love today. And he did no wrong in that list. And it put me on a trajectory of uh, experience the best of the best. And um, by the time I was 15, I got a computer and... I uh, I was immediately drawn to Anus because there was the Alan Moses recommendations all there and these great reviews. And there were reviews that I had to read multiple times, like you said, as a kid, to comprehend what was actually being expressed. And it, it re- like he, we talk about like the great philosophers. They're, they're just talking about life and putting it in words that we wish we would have expressed. Like, yes, I understand this aspect of life. No one's really expressed that. And we're able to, you know, find out. It's like Schopenhauer, for instance, is able to uh, express a lot of things that I had known but never been able to properly express. And by reading his material, I was like, oh, there it is. And that's the same thing at the anus where... Um, I had been listening to these albums and I've been more into like death metal, death metal, black metal, black metal. And I read his reviews like, this is what I'm experiencing. This is the fucking profundity of the music that I'm experiencing. And, uh, yes, I did become friends with the, uh, author VJ Prozac, also known as Brett Stevens and the alt right and all that. Um, uh, and uh, we we were uh, good friends in real life because we're both in Texas. But uh, um, I think we're on still on like approachable terms, not like good friends and all that. But um, I still think we both have a degree of respect for each other. And uh, like Shelly, I have grown away from the anus. Um, I want to branch out and do my own thing, and you know. When I was doing the good craft, you know, early on, having his input on that really helped me to discover what I was actually creating. And, uh, yeah, I, I, the wisdom that he has bestowed to me throughout my life is, uh, is without a price. It's fucking eternal. Um, go ahead, Tyler. So I'll start instead of going into an in depth analysis by uh, coming out of the closet, so to speak, and outright admitting that uh, I've written material for this website, including rather recently. Uh, So take that into consideration when I say what I'm about to say. But 
I feel that regardless of your opinion on any of the politicization of the website or even your opinion of their perspective on extreme metal, that one of the things that can be said, which is essentially reiterating what Shelley said, is that in, in many ways, um, Anus.com, the Dark Legion's archive, and continuing on into Death Metal Underground is possibly the granddaddy of critical analysis of heavy metal online. It's an extremely old website if you take into consideration all of the various forms in which it's existed throughout the years, and was one of the very first ones that was at least a majorly known voice for looking at extreme metal with a critical eye. Its contributions, I feel, especially the contributions of its editor, its founder, are invaluable. And I know many people who don't particularly care for many of the opinions of Death Metal Underground don't uh, or disagree with them even to a pretty large extent who have outright said that staples of staple opinions of the underground metal scene today are uh, large parts of it are actually in some ways directly attributable to the work of this person uh, one example in particular is Demi Leach has legendary status in the underground, and that is in large part due to their quality. But uh, many, pe- I've seen many people say if it wasn't for the work of Prozac doing the footwork on the ground of um, telling people about Demi Leach, of getting the word out there about how great they were, uh, they might not be as well known today in the underground scene as they are. Uh, He was one of the loudest spoken advocates of them for a large period of time. And I think that's just one example of the contributions that he's made to uh, extreme metal, to understanding extreme metal, and to having a sort of discernment for what quality in extreme metal is. And not even just quality, but for understanding the particular artistic expression that extreme metal is. That could be a good summarization of what death metal underground has given to the extreme metal phenomenon is understanding it as an artistic movement not just another flavor of rock and roll music not just another flavor of some kind of music that you can turn on your radio or on your headphones or whatever but what its particular artistic expression is so i think that regardless of how much you agree or disagree with uh this uh, website, how you feel about their positions on things, it should at least be noted that they've made, uh, as I said before, invaluable contributions to understanding extreme metal and to promoting it. Yeah, and I think I think that's one of the main motivations I had for starting Hate Meditations. And like we've discussed a few other things on here, and a lot of them are spin-offs, like uh you know obviously hessian firm i think scale it back was involved not involved but he was like related to part of the sort of anus like ecosystem um and yeah there's there's lots of like people that are clearly influenced by it and i think that's kind of what i wanted to at least start contributing to is sort of taking that underlying philosophy of here's how you listen to metal like you don't just do what banger tv do which is just every single release that comes out you give a really cookie cutter 10 minute review on it and say this guitar tone is like fucking rips uh buy this album it's like no here it here's here's where it stood in history like here's here's where metal was in the early 1980s or whatever here's what was going on in the world and here's how metal responded to that and here's how it was um like mutated and here's how it was evolved and so on and and then sort of getting to the nitty-gritty of um how black metal say responded to death metal um but sort of the underlying um mechanics of the music itself like he will like situate it in the social historic and economic setting but he'll very much talk to the music on its own terms um, and i think that's really important um is that he's not using it to uh prop up 
the personality he wants to get across. He's not using it to prop up an image that he wants to convey. He's coming at the music on its own terms. What is it doing? What is it communicating? And how does it go about those things? And why is it important? And I think that's the really kind of the crux of the matter. And a lot of the other publications that we're talking about this entire episode have been how can this music service the personality that I want to convey or what products do I need to buy? And the, the more you get into like the, I mean, I don't want to sound pretentious, but it's almost, it's not metal journalism anymore. It's like philosophy almost. It's what is the philosophy of this music? Not how is it serving me, but what is this music saying about the world? And that sounds really basic when I say it out loud, it's like, well, that's really obvious, but it's, it's not when you actually look at the meat of a lot of metal journalism now, the extent to which it has uh, become so superficial um, and surface level. And that's kind of, yeah, that's why I keep doing what I'm doing is because I, I do want to carry on that legacy of no, expect more, not just of music, but expect more of how you approach this music and what what you should be expecting of the art that confronts you and what you should be demanding of it. Like stop demanding mediocrity and average and sort of saying that's okay. Like let's really dig down to what, this music is saying and i think that that legacy is um is something worth preserving even though i have yeah very clear like problems with other aspects of the website and the individual himself but but yeah that that's probably my general take on it all right let's wrap up this iceberg all right uh so what do you want me to do? We don't want you to just summarize it. I think I already have, but <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. Let's just close out the episode. We've gone on for too long now, and uh, yeah, we we started out just criticizing, you know, some aspects of the metal media, and then it became a very heartfelt <laughs> type of uh, endeavor. But uh, yeah, uh, Shelley, uh, thank you very much for hosting today um you know doing the powerpoint presentation that we have in front of us um great contributions on hate meditations and i hope you keep going uh and tyler uh thank you for your input today it was really great to hear your thoughts and opinions on uh why some of the the publications and you know media here succeeds and why some of it fails so um great uh input all around um wonderful uh episode today uh thank you both thank you jason thank you i'll see you later